Assembly Transport. I'd also like to welcome our visitors in the gallery and uh, hope that you enjoy watching and listening to our proceedings. Uh, can I ask, though, at this point, including myself, to make sure that all your mobile devices are switched at least to silent, please, uh, in order to avoid any interruptions. Declarations of interest. Uh, committee members are minded to note the list of interests on the papers and also to declare any that they haven't declared up to this point. All right. Good. Thank you. Right, so this brings us to the main event, cycling infrastructure. First, I'd like to start by welcoming our guests. Put the glasses on for that. So, first of all, Simon, welcome. And you're the infrastructure campaigner at the London Cycling Campaign. Welcome. Matt Winfield, you're the London Director of Sustrains. Welcome. Dr Justin Spinney, and you are lecturer at the Human Geography University of Cardiff, is that right? Lovely. And Dr Rachel Aldred, you're senior lecturer at Transport University of Westminster. And then we come to Chris Boardman, MBE, congratulations. Uh, cycling and Walking Commissioner for Greater Manchester. I'm sure we all see as you as a, I think we all see you as someone who's owned by the country, not just by Manchester, oh, though, Chris. <laughs> and then Richard Dilks, who's the Programme Director for London First. So welcome, everybody. It's a, it's a big committee. A big committee. We, we normally have slightly smaller panels. So what I would uh, say to members and also to, to guests, you know, feel free to ask any questions and feel free to answer questions, but clearly we don't have to have every question answered by every member of the panel. Okay? Thank you. Right, so if we uh, kick off then with the first question, which is mine, it's a very open, broad question, actually, and uh, I would actually, on this occasion, appreciate the views of every member. So we'll start with you, Simon, and we'll work across the... The table. Uh, what are the biggest barriers to improving cycling infrastructure in London? Simon, if you'd like to kick off. I think the key answer to that really is the boroughs um, at the moment. So we have a massive issue with political will um, to deliver cycling infrastructure um, that varies dramatically from borough to borough. Um, we also have issues with TfL um, and their willingness to uh, remove road space from motor vehicles, private motor vehicles particularly. Um, and to deliver in rapidly enough. So modelling, capacity concerns, etc., trump cycling schemes and delay cycling infrastructure routinely. Um, so we, we've had the mayor uh, state very clearly his ambitions um, on uh, active travel, um, and he's also pledged to triple the mileage of protected space on main roads, to fix junctions, to double the cycling budget. That's all very welcome, but the question here is what he can do to exert enough pressure downward onto TfL, onto the boroughs, to ensure that those pledges actually are fulfilled. Um, so that's the, the, that's the key for cycling infrastructure, to deliver rapidly enough and to deliver to the right quality. Yeah. Matt. Yeah, so there's going to be some repetition here, I think. Um, <laughs> so the political will is vital. Uh, I think Janet Steek Khan, who was referenced in the paper that we got, she said, if you push the status quo, the status quo pushes back. Um, and, and that does happen. That's our experience. We know a couple of things about this. We know that cycle infrastructure is popular. Um, consultations we've been involved in typically have 60% and upwards in favour. Um, Sustrans National Organisation, we do a, a survey of attitudes to cycling called Bike Life. I've got it here, published a couple of months ago. It includes Greater Manchester. And this says that 70% of people um, are in favour of cycling infrastructure, even to the detriment of motor vehicles. So we know that it's popular. We know that when it's in, people like it. Um, we, we've got so much evidence to su support this, but we know it's painful politically in the short term. Um, a specific example I'd like to share is in Estrum Road in, in Lambeth, where we uh, were looking to, change, to um, take out some of the car traffic going through that road. The initial kind of discussion with the local community suggested that 30% were in favour. We did a trial there for uh, six months, and after that trial, 60% of people wanted that trial to be made permanent. Um, so, yeah, political issue right the way through leadership from the mayor, which we have, and then through every level in local authorities. Um, there is a, an issue around resourcing and technical capability. Um, there was a discussion here yesterday, I think, about money. Uh, clearly an issue. So I think Borough's funding has been cut by 60% in the decade from 2009 to 10. So 
when Andrew spoke to you, Andrew Gilligan, I think he talked about some boroughs having uh, ability um, and some boroughs having a resource but, but not the ability to do the job and kind of varying capacity in local authorities. We also kind of need to remember that the level of spending cycling in London uh, is fairly new, so there just isn't a massive pool of high-quality highway engineers out there who really get cycling. That's changing. TfL have an apprenticeship programme. We do too. We're only small, but that's an issue. Um, just to pick up again on, on the funding point, that the Mayor's commitment to £770 million for cycling over five years is really important. Clearly, it could be more. There are issues with spending money. Um, but I think the amount of money sets the ambition uh, against other modes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to avoid too much repetition there, I'd just like to pick up on one point there and perhaps develop it a little bit, and it's around that idea of, of the temporary trialling of schemes, which I think is integral to positive forms of public participation. Uh, a lot uh, of the delay in construction of schemes and a lot of the kickback against schemes has been around issues around consultation and participation. Um, but we've seen uh, in many, many places that if we can trial schemes uh, and prototype schemes in a way, that that is a you know, key form of public participation and to gain kind of traction with the community. So I think that's so certainly something that should be emphasised. And the fact that that should be done from a very early stage rather than when plans have been relatively well developed. Um, I was pleased to see this question because I've just published a paper called Barriers to Investing in Cycling as Survey of English <laughs> Stakeholders. So um, just a couple, that. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things from that. Um, so London, you'll be pleased to know, people feel more positive than in other parts of um, England in terms of investing in cycling, but that is partly because there is a lot of pessimism in a lot of the rest of the country. Um, so it's still a patchy picture in London. Political and financial barriers were seen to be the most important and the most problematic, and particularly political barriers, political will, that you know, even if you had the money in some cases, if you didn't have the high-level political support throughout, that could still block investing in cycling cycling. Um, so people in respect of London talked about variable political and organisational commitment. So for example, within Transport for London, perhaps there's varying levels of commitment to healthy streets. Some departments in TfL are very signed up, perhaps others less so. And also boroughs potentially having varying attitudes to cycling. So we often need political support at all levels, councillors, MPs, not just the mayor. And that can be really important throughout because we haven't yet managed to mainstream cycling um, into planning in London and the rest of the country. I think it's important also to say that it's a political, not primarily an engineering problem. And maybe there are three broad issues. So firstly, change is always difficult, whatever policy area. If you're trying to do something differently, it's always hard. Secondly, in terms of sustainable transport, any kind of changes in support of sustainable transport are difficult, not just in the UK. If you're seen to challenge the position of the car, so it providing for buses and walking can also be challenging. But also, finally, we have particular issues with cycling in this country. It's been particularly marginalised, particularly stigmatised. So that is a final sort of barrier that perhaps other sustainable modes don't face. So that is why we need this high level political support, political support at all levels throughout, um, not just in terms of planning schemes, but execution, getting, ensuring that all the details are right as well. So really, political will is the big thing, as Simon said, I think. Thank you. Well, in the interest of, of efficiency, I was just going to say that, <laughs> but, but maybe that's the point, um, that you've got a group here and, and people who've preceded us who've said exactly the same thing. I'd put a slightly different emphasis, I would say political courage, actually, to upset the status quo, another word that's been used again and again, uh, but it does take political will to get things done. Uh, this is seen as a political issue, and it's not every survey that's done says the public wants it. Everybody assumes that this is going to be a political problem. And I think that's because we just give way too much emphasis to the voice for a minority. Um, there's something about, well, negative news makes a headline, and so it makes a headline, and the headline makes people think this is what everybody thinks. Um, and I think we need to give much more weight to the, to the quiet majority in making decisions. To avoid repetition, I'll just make a couple of um, additional points. One, I think, is that the, the borough coordination problem is something I see in all sorts of areas of, of my work. So, of course, this is not unique to cycling. You see it in uh, Doppler's bike chair, you see it in freight, etc. I think it'd be interesting to think about how uh, 
what further mechanisms, conduits can there be for TfL and the boroughs to work together on these things? Because we're not going to manage to entirely take the politics out of it, much as I recognise all that's been said on that point here. Um, and the other point, I think, is just it, as the, the question is about barriers to improving the infrastructure, it is, of course, contested space. There, there is a finite amount of road space in London, so I think we have to identify one of the barriers, in addition to all that's been mentioned, uh, is that there are other people who want to use that space. Mm. Could I just come back to um, Rachel? Um, I was very intrigued by your comment that cycling has been especially stigmatised. And I wondered if you could unpack that a bit and say who it has been stigmatised by and in what way it has been especially stigmatised. Yes, yeah, sure. So this... Um, I think something being stigmatised doesn't necessarily mean that there's a small group of people who are specifically doing that. I think it's about the way we talk about cycling, the way we plan for cycling, the way we think about cycling. So I'm not necessarily identifying somebody as the baddie here. But when I, I wrote a paper in 2013 that kind of identified the extent to which um, when cycling is talked about, it's seen as something a small minority do, probably a strange minority, possibly people who dress differently, who are not representative of the wider community. Um, and it's sort of seen as something a bit weird you have to be a bit brave to cycle so it's kind of this this narrative of something that is not normal that is for people who are strange and that is um, sort of a small group of people and often that can shade into hostility um, in that cycling is seen as green but then it can be seen as something that people who are eco warriors eco fascists do so there's a range of different things going on and I think one thing that is interesting is that when I've done talk to people in other European countries this this does not exist in many countries so talking to people in Sweden and trying to explain the way we talk about cycling here they just were bemused by it and they couldn't understand it so this is something that exists in the UK in the US I would say and in Australia but you know in much of Europe doesn't exist in the same regard and I think it's kind of an extra barrier because we don't talk about walking in the same way there are certainly a lot of barriers to planning for walking but we not not this one yes, uh, to you Rachel I mean, you talked about the uh, barriers to improving cycles so you've just done a paper on that and the biggest cause you found was political resistance. What are barriers to political will? What's preventing politicians making the changes they're required? An interesting point, and I would, I would say I did t talk mostly about the political issues, that was the biggest thing, but there are a whole range of other things. And sometimes, sometimes intervening elsewhere can be helpful. So um, tools in terms of planning for cycling is not a major barrier, but if we create better tools that politicians can use to see, for example, where the cycling potential exists in their area, that can also be helpful. And I think we don't, you know, people don't necessarily know about planning for cycling. Local councillors don't know. Why would they know? They're not experts. So I think maybe there's an education job to be done there as well. We, we're just starting to do things differently for cycling. So we need to get that message out there, I think. The message about the benefits, the message about the fact that everyone can cycle. As I mentioned, there's still a perception that cycling is only for the young, the fit, the able-bodied. If you go to the Netherlands, if you go to Cambridge, you'll see that's not the case. But that's still a perception. So I think partly getting over that perception and being able to communicate with council and so on, that cycling can solve a lot of problems. It's not that we just want lots of people cycling for its own sake. It can actually free up road space, it can keep people healthy, it can help people access jobs if they're on low incomes, they're struggling to afford other forms of transport. So I think getting that message across is important too. Thank, Thank you. you. So we move on to section two. Carol. Yeah, can I just um, pick up, um, we've talked about the Mayor of London being supportive of cycling, I presume the Mayor of Manchester is, that's why you've been appointed, Chris. But what about the Department of Transport? They, they have a role in this as well. Are they strongly committed to promoting cycling and walking and putting money out there for directly elected mayors and boroughs to be able to take this agenda forward? The Department of Transport, with my fairly limited experience up and so far, are a very cautious body and, uh, and also uncomfortable with the status quo so without wishing to hark on without direction from above saying we want change then they'll just keep it the same uh, and there's a number of initiatives that we're interested in at the moment so for example the turning the corner campaign mm -hmm. which would bring us into line with the rest of the world but I think it's Malta Hong Kong that also don't have some form of give way when turning um, that's something that could be government led which would change how we design the streets and allow us to make much better provision for pedestrians and cyclists. So that's something the DFT could do and we've had to push them really hard 
to even look at that. Um, and I think that's one of the things that cities, uh, particularly cycling-focused cities, could get together on. Mm. Uh, have a very strong voice when combined and go and see DFT with, with uh, a list of asks. But they're a cautious organisation, and rightly so, I think. But where the evidence is there, I think we could get together and push hard to mm. get some change to how we use our street space. Yeah. That might be something we want to recommend that the Mayor works with the other cities, because I know he's I've met, met with, with the other Will mayors, Norman hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Can I just pick up the point of give way on when turning? What was that point? I'm sorry. I the give way on turning point you made. Yeah, it's a Turning the Corner campaign. It uh, was launched by British Cycling over a year ago, I think uh, it was now. Uh, and it essentially, it's cunningly simple. Um, when you're turning, doesn't matter how you're travelling, you give way to anybody who's going straight ahead. So that could be somebody walking. It protects the elderly, uh, people with prams, walkers mostly. But at junctions, the priority is to give way to anybody who's going straight ahead. And it, it allows a simplification of junctions as well. So junctions have been modelled at up to 47% more efficient for motor traffic as well, because it just means that everybody goes that way and everybody goes that way, regardless of how you're travelling. Um, it's not... It's not uh, a panacea, it yeah, isn't I'm, something I'm that fixes with everything. Yeah, I didn't, I, so I, I your density in London is quite specific, so you, yeah. you just keep signalised junctions where, where, it's quiet, where it's required for pedestrians. Um, but for the majority of the country and huge swathes of the city, it would allow a much simpler design. Yes, I, I, I misheard what you said. Okay, yeah, I, I wanted to you. move on to my main question, actually, which is about cycle superhighways, which obviously um, the previous mayor um, started to introduce, started a few in his first term. They weren't quite so successful or retrofitted, and then he's roll he rolled out a number more. Uh, and and um, the current mayor has now been out to consultation on, on two cycle superhighway routes. How effective do you think these segregated cycle su superhighways have been so far? Maybe, we'll, should we start with Simon? I mean, I think inarguably very effective. TfL's figures show how effective they've already been, or, or rather, should I clarify and say the latter ones. So we have two phases of cycle superhighways, the blue paint era, um, and then the, the protected tracks. And we've seen explosive growth on, on the, the ones that feature protected, mm. uh, separated tracks. Um, so the simple answer is they clearly work. They, they deliver huge numbers of cyclists. Um, and, and so the issue is not, you know, should we be doing them? It's how quickly can we do them? Where can we do them? Um, and this, in a way, harks back to Chris's point about turning the corner. Um, we know it works, and, and the issue is partly design knowledge, partly political will, and partly some technical constraints, which are about things like the size of junctions mm -hmm. needed to fully separate turning movements. Um, so we need to really push hard on these, and, and I, think, I think we need to stop having a conversation in a way about should we be doing cycle superhighways. Um, the simple answer is we should just be doing loads of them all over London. Um, the strategic cycling analysis, uh, which I think you're probably going to come on to, later uh, in this question is, is key and shows, demonstrates, you know, so many of the high priority routes, there is no viable parallel alternative via quiet routes. You know, it would send everyone round the houses, which we tried for years with London Cycle Network. Mm. So um, I think the simple answer is they do work. They're demonstrably working. They demonstrably aren't causing huge amounts of congestion. Again, Dr. Aldred may speak more on this uh, and was involved in a TfL study on this. Um, and, and so really, at the end of the day, the, the, the big question is, is not are they working. The big question is why aren't we doing them as quickly as we can. And have you any evidence at all of whether newer people have come to cycling because of these protected cycle routes? I don't personally, and the cycling campaign obviously doesn't have the, the capacity to no. do that, but TfL does, and it's said that, that there, are new, there are lots of new people. So there is an, an awful lot of rerouting. There are people who are choosing, who are already cycling, but choosing to, to use the protected routes, uh, the cycle superhighways, the better ones, um, out of preference. But they are also saying very clearly that there are a lot of people um, coming in. They're also saying that the profile of cycling is, is broadening, it's diversifying. Um, and, and we see that again rising alongside protected routes, not just in London, but wherever that's done. Okay, who else would like to come in on how effective? Matt. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Cycle Superhighways programme is 10 years old this year, so uh, it has taken a while to move from the early kind of paint stuff that Simon described to what is now really good, high quality, well used infrastructure. You don't need to go too far from here to see that. Um, the, Perhaps the most exciting thing for us is the, the capacity of these spaces. So what we've done is create new space in the heart of London. And I can't think of any other programme that can do that for this level of spend. 
So um, some of these corridors are now carrying 5% more people. They don't, you look at them and they look quite quiet occasionally in the middle of the day, but they're carrying 5% more people. They are much more uh, efficient, that's important to get that right, <laughs> efficient, in moving people than the previous road layout. So there's a strong argument to do it. It's an important part of, of any um, plan to get more people cycling in London. Rachel. Just briefly, not to repeat what others have said, but in terms of um, safety, I'm hoping that there's going to be uh, a big impact from these protected superhighways because there's evidence that protected tracks reduce risk. In one Canadian study, the odds for people cycling on a protected track were one-ninth the injury odds of people cycling on a busy road with parked cars. So potentially there could be a big increase in safety and further safety in numbers. My work has um, found safety in numbers at a route segment level. So you get additional safety benefits from the fact that they've attracted new cyclists. So I'm hoping that they will help us with our injury risk problem too. Well, I, I, back in September when Andy Burnham asked me to, to take on this role, the first thing I did was go and talk to lots of people and we got down to real basic psychology and started at the other end and said if we want huge amounts of modal shift significant amounts what would that take and um, it, it just prompted a slightly different way of thinking um, you, we realized that infrastructure was for people in cars it's not for people on bikes I've no interest in people on bikes they'll be a, a side beneficiary of this but if you want genuine modal shift then somebody who is currently in a vehicle has to want to use it. So then the question becomes, what would make me want to use it? And it is overwhelmingly, it must be easy, attractive and safe. And if it's not those three things, all of them, probably in that order, then I'm not getting out of the car. I'm not going to get out of any kind of vehicle and do that. <coughs> so it has to be those three things. And a big chunk of that is safe, easy space that's convenient, goes where I want to go, uninterrupted, and it puts me first. Um, and that is your super highways. And all your evidence shows, unsurprisingly, that when you put one in, lots of people use it. Um, and it, it, it's amazing to me that we, we keep getting this evidence time and time and time again, and then we still have to fight for it. We should actually be having to fight to keep car space, not the other way around, <laughs> if we looked at evidence. Yeah. Richard, do you want to come but also could you comment on whether you think the Mayor will actually meet his ambition, which is to triple the current superhighway provision? Well, I think it's roughly the right ambition. The timing's looking quite tight, I think you have to say, but who knows? But having said that, I mean, so I think there's been a bit of a hiatus um, from 2016 and the mayor coming in, which has now been broken by CS4 and CS9 coming forward into consultations. It feels to me like things are really mm. moving on the, the big segregated, um, if you like, current generation of cycles. By the way, I think it's worth making a big distinction between the first and the second generation. So, the, the, mm. you know, the first really are just the blue paint, um, possibly almost worse than what was there before yes. in the sense of giving a sense of false security, perhaps. The second... Uh, current generation is that is the game changer type of space that London has not had before and certainly as a user that's how it feels it is a light bulb moment when you go on to them and off them um, which takes me to a point I wanted to make so I think we're never going to manage to get cycle superhighways up and down every strategic road in London um, although we will I should imagine manage to get quite a few more um, and even if we did, of course, people don't just want to go to strategic roads. Their final destination and start point is somewhere else, um, usually, So, despite high percentages on those main roads. So we have to integrate these things really well. They have to handle junctions really well, which I think is where some of the, this current generation do actually struggle a bit. For all that they are a game changer, the junctions are, are the tricky bits, and some of them aren't very good. They're really quite complicated. Um, so there is still a need to think about you know, the central London bike grid and what's happening with that, the quiet way programme and what's happening with that. On the data point, I think, you know, the, the Travel in London 10 report is out recently covering um, up to 2016. That shows cycle trip rates up 8.2%, five-year rolling average is 43 So I think you have to say there has to be some correlation there between that second generation coming in mm. and that uptick in cycle trips. Excellent. In terms of the mayor... Yes, sorry. sorry um, what would, well, you very, I think very generously said hiatus, um, <laughs> and, and we did see a, a stalling, I think it's fair to say. One of the things I've noticed in, in my research, I'm astounded by, is the current administration didn't take advantage from the hard-won learning from the previous experts that worked on this. There was no, I mean, Andrew Gilligan 
wasn't consulted. Um, and I think you saw for yourselves the depth of knowledge there, whether people agree with all his views or not, mm. the depth of learning yes. there. Um, one of the things he mentioned in his evidence was he, the most sophisticated opponents, the, the most potent weapon was the filibuster. And then the, the current administration then walked straight into the same thing and said, well, we think we can do this better. The, the people that have said they, they were difficult, well, they seem really great to us. And it was exactly the same thing. Um, and I'm going to meet him this evening. I'm seeing Isabel Dedring today, uh, Brian Deegan, incredible transport mm. planner. Thank you very much. We're going to have him in Manchester. The expertise, uh, and that expertise is hard won in this. This is a pioneering field. It just hasn't been used fully at all. Mm. And I'm quite amazed by that. Mm. And it's learning from experts here, and I think previously we've pushed for learning from other European cities where this mm. has been going on since the 70s, and it's just in everyone's DNA how we can learn that and then ensure Well, I really hope it it's not party on. political and that people weren't kept simply because of their, their political yeah. affiliations. Um, I'm, I'm working in a labour, uh, in a very distorted labour area, and Andrew Gilligan is, is you know, his, his experience is invaluable, and I intend to use him a lot. I don't really care what party he, he's, he belongs to. It's his information and his abilities that I'm interested in. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I wanted, to, I picked up with Richard this issue about whether the mayor is going to meet it, and you're saying the timings are tight. Obviously, there has been some delay. Um, are there any particular reasons why we think these cycle super routes have taken longer than expected to get built in general? And um, Simon, you've already started to touch on the strategic cycling analysis, um, which I know a lot of work went into. I've met with some of the officers, but nothing new in there, really? Is that, is that, is that your summary, Simon? I, I disagree that there's nothing new. I mean, I think what we see in the strategic cycling analysis is, is a validation of what has very often been said by cycle campaigners, by people on the ground. Um, so there aren't massive surprises, particularly with the radial routes, but what we are seeing is the potential, for instance, for non-radial, non-traditional non mm. commuter routes. So you start to see in the top 25 uh, corridors routes that, that don't go directly in and out of central London. Yes. Um, and so I think, I think there is an awful lot of surprise, and there's a lot of depth in the data there, but I think more importantly than that, um, what the strategic cycling analysis shows is, is that there is genuine potential. Um, so we have boroughs in London who say essentially there is no potential for cycling, no one will ever cycle here, everyone drives, you know, and, and now we have a map that shows directly where in their borough people will cycle if you build high quality cycling infrastructure. That argument is over and I think that that map really mm. pr demonstrates that very clearly. Um, in terms of barriers and, and why the cycle superhighways haven't come along as quick as they should, I mean I think this goes back to Chris's point um, about the fact that when the new administration came in there was, a, there was a big pause but more than that there was an attempt to and it's an ongoing attempt to kind of soften out the controversy the bike lash the, the issues to do with cycle superhighways that have come up we've seen multiple stakeholders with every single one of the major cycle superhighways um, come back fight back uh, say that there would be increased congestion say all sorts of things uh, most of which have not called, not turned out to be true but but those folks are now even more than before i think able to delay the process with cs11 um, through Regent's Park, we're sitting on one stakeholder who is just, in, as far as I can hit, understand and hear, is just waiting at every meeting, changes their position constantly, and the Mayor and Will Norman and, and the administration at the moment is allowing that to happen. Um, we know the consultation was successful and, you know, the, the public said they wanted this, um, and most of the stakeholders, uh, including some very surprising ones who were initially very sceptical about it, have also said they wanted it, so now we need to get on and do it. And, and that same process, that elongated process, is drawn out across all the new cycle superhighways. Um, now, there is some value to that. There is some value to bringing more people along, as, as many as you can, more stakeholders, as businesses, etc. But ultimately, there has to come a point where you say, no, we've listened, we've adapted, but we're just going to put this in now. Um, and, and that seems to be the issue at the moment to me, is that there's an unwillingness just to press that final button. A stronger backbone on these issues because it is difficult when you're getting a lot of opposition but yep. actually you think this is your commitment you need to deliver it well otherwise otherwise Sadiq's going to miss his pledge and, and I don't want that to happen yeah. does anyone else want to comment on any of the further points Matt just a quick one on uh, the likelihood of um, meeting the target so um, 
the previous administration didn't start building in earnest until February 2015, mm. so kind of 14, 15 months out from the election. Um, if everything that's being worked on now, um, all of that adds up to the targets, the average time to build one of those schemes in the previous uh, administration was about 12 months. I mean, there's hugely different lengths of stuff going in. But So if, if work starts 18 months, two years before the election, so imminently, I think there is, a, there is a very good chance of meeting that target. Um, we've talked about political will being the main issue, and it certainly is. We've got um, a colleague I work with who works at Hounslow during the CS9, trying to uh, work on that. Um, and he just talked about the technical complexity in getting very, a solution that in Chiswick, which is you know a difficult area to work in, um, and ticks a lot of the boxes and the issues that we've discussed already. Um, but it did take quite a long time to find something that gave high quality service to cyclists, but um, was acceptable in that community. Uh, and the, the solution is um, a two-way cycle track, which is great, but it took a while. It was fairly complex. Just on the strategic <coughs> cycling analysis, which I think yeah. is a really good piece of work, having done some related cycling uh, potential analysis in uh, other parts of the country in particular, I don't think we should just judge research on whether it brings surprises. It's always um, worthwhile <laughs> doing good research that tells you something useful, often what we think is wrong. So research that tells us that what we think is right is also useful. But what the key thing with the strategic cycling analysis is getting it used in policy and planning. And I worry that's still not happening. It's, it's not just cycling cycling potential, it's walking potential, and the data is amazing, it's granular data, it's, it could be really useful for borough planning, but do the boroughs have that data, do they know how to use that data, are they using it in business cases and planning and so on, and I think that isn't happening at the moment and it needs to be mainstreamed, you know, we hear so often, you know, the model says no in relation to traffic models for motor traffic, do we hear the model says no in relation to cycling traffic, walking traffic, so those models need to be used. Just to join on with that, the, um, I think there is great value in the strategic cycling analysis, actually. I don't think there are many surprises for perhaps people like us, but to Simon and Rachel's point, that you know there might be some surprises for other relevant people, borough planners and so on, there's value in that too. Um, I think the, the data-led aspect of it is its great strength, and that is a new thing. So it might not be a surprising thing, but it is a new thing for London. We've not had this to date at a London level. So I think that's very, very welcome and just to be built on. And by built on, I'd encourage TfL to go more widely into relevant data sources to work out the potential for cycling, because this is quite a tricky thing to work out when you have such an obvious chicken and egg problem with relatively low cycling rates across London still. How do you know? There is survey data, official and unofficial and so on. Um, but I think there's some data sources from the dockless bike operators that are starting to operate in London. There are uh, the potential to use mobile phone data to check movement patterns to see what journeys there could be mapped onto cycling. So I think TfL should think you know, really broadly, do some deals perhaps, have some conversations about how it can build on what's in, the, um, in that analysis and, uh, and go broadly. Because only there, I think, do you start to scratch into the true potential for cycling in London. Thank well, you very more much. Point on consultation, um, and perhaps it's my naivety, but the, uh, there doesn't seem to be any measurement for what is enough. So you have, brought, you think broadly for all schemes, between 60 and 90 percent support, and it's still not enough. So what is enough? And there's a question I'd like to, I will be setting for the leaders of Manchester before the consultation. What is the go no go point? Yes. You know, yes. we've just left Europe on two, two percent ish. So, you know, that happened. The biggest decision we'll make in a generation. But for cycle schemes, sixty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent, we're still worried about it. Well, what would be enough? A hundred percent. It's never going to happen. So, set that marker in advance, uh, and so everybody manage people's expectations. Really. Thank you. Thank you. I finished. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. I mean, one of the core challenges is that every data, uh, data is useful if you're giving useful information, but the question is how do you translate that data into practicalities? And I, I come from a background in medicine where, where we see a lot of laboratory data, but getting it onto the patient care is, is, is a different thing. But the real challenge is, is how do you translate this data into practicalities for borrowers to be able to bring about changes? Do we have any tools to, 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 for that happen? I think, I think you do, but I think it's an excellent point. So I think it, it, it can get pretty fine-grained pretty quickly. Um, and what you can't do is simply look crudely at a uh, number of journeys that are under two kilometres, say, and think, well, 
that we can just map all those straight over to cycling, that's going to be wonderful because there's some very obvious barriers. Uh, partly are those single trips part of a longer chain of journeys, partly what luggage, children, etc. do people have, mobility needs and so on. So you really need to build as much of that data, the metadata, if you like, into it all to understand what the, the true potential is. And of course that's only looking at the potential. There's then your point about how you how you what action on the ground mm. do you take to link up with that potential um which probably worth um saying that it is about fixed infrastructure um but it is also of course about other points there are cultural points here there's access to bikes themselves there's confidence levels there's role for cycle training there's dockless bike operators and the way they can lower barriers of accessibility so it's not just all about you know, the fixed infrastructure on roads and this, uh, is there any data to explain why the BMA community takes up cycling less than the, than the other, uh, other populations? Um, yeah, just to, to, to say something on that point. We're still, I'm really interested in this issue of um, equity in cycling and inclusive cycling. And I think we're still often, um, uh, we're very early stages in a lot of this research, I think. Some, of, some research has been done in the United States and Canada in North America looking at this issue. And for instance, they found that in some um, parts of the US, I think they looked at Chicago, so by, where bike infrastructure had been built, it was disproportionately in more affluent areas, for instance. So we need to look at things like distribution of infrastructure. Um, does infrastructure serve the destinations that people want to use? So this has been found to be an issue with bus provision, for instance. So bus routes um, are put in radially, they go into a city centre, and we say, ah, oh, everybody has access to the bus. But for some people, some communities, the kind of trips they want to make are not into the city centre, they're into shopping areas and so on and the outskirts employment destinations on the outskirts so we need to do that kind of analysis for cycling and not just build stuff and assume that it serves everybody's trips we need to look at the kind of trips people want to make we need to look at things like access to bikes as well but I think um, what, we, what we've seen is that we don't necessarily need to have the inequalities, the, the wide range of demographic inequalities we currently see in cycling in London. So if you look at the US, for instance, actually um, people from black and minority ethnic groups in the US cycle to work at higher rates than white people and are taking up cycling faster. So, you know, there are no fixed boundaries. We can build for it. We can change the pattern of who cycles. Carlson, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was really... Uh, I was reading a document which was TfL's own from 2011 and it was a report on um, sort of black and minority ethnic sort of cycling um, and it was looking very much at those sort of barriers and one of the things uh, it did show to some extent it had uh, an analysis of uh, CS7 and CS3 um, and, and showed that even when those routes had been built, uh, they still didn't get as many of the black and minority ethnic cyclists or those on low income uh, on those routes as they would have thought given the population of those areas. So there's still some other work to be done beyond the physical engineering in understanding some of the social and cultural levers that we need to pull in order to get a broader range of people cycling. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Right, we move now on to uh, Sean in Quiet Way. Morning, I just wanted to have a little meander through the reality or not of quiet ways. And I'd like to start with um, may maybe Simon. How effective do you think quiet ways have been at attracting a more diverse people from London to, to get into cycling? I've got to be very careful sitting next to Matt here, but um, my, my simple answer is not nowhere near enough. Um, we, uh, London Cycling Campaign, we are really disappointed with the Quiet Way programme, and, and that's actually not Matt's fault or Sus Transport's, we think. Um, we think there is a real issue whereby the way that they have been sold to boroughs, to borough officers and borough councillors, is as low-level interventions. Um, the way that they've been sold to the public um, is as routes for those less confident. Um, and those two uh, ideas are fundamentally opposed to each other. Um, if you want less confident people to cycle, you need high levels of interventions on the roads in terms of infrastructure because those roads need to be genuinely quiet. Um, and that's really the big issue. So, so if you have someone who's less confident in cycling, um, every single close pass, every single aggressive driver that they encounter, that's going to be a massive barrier and put them off. Um, every single quiet way so far has major gaps in, it, in its provision in terms of the level and volume and the speed of traffic encountered 
the kinds of junctions and the kinds of experiences that cyclists have at those junctions. So what we are seeing is, is that the, the best of the quiet ways are growing very, very fast in terms of numbers, much lower uh, overall numbers and volumes of cyclists than, than cyclists with highways, but similar levels of, of percentage year-on-year -year growth of, of people cycling. But I would argue that we're not seeing the more diverse community um, embracing the quiet ways in the way that we would hope that they should do. Um, and, and I think that is fundamentally because of gaps. And those gaps are down to borough willingness. Um, so the boroughs are not willing to tackle their junctions, their roads, to the level needed. Um, and what we are seeing, and we believe, is that in some of the Mini Holland schemes, we are seeing some of that, and we're seeing quiet ways almost appear by default, um, but we're just not seeing that on the quiet ways where boroughs are not willing to do the work needed. Maybe address this about why are boroughs not willing to take this on? Because if you listen to this conversation, all of this works. It's all very rosy. You 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 do a, a trial. You know people love it. Um, politicians are nothing if not self-preserving. If they feel that something is going to work out and you have all this evidence, why are why is there a lack of will to deliver these things? Is that for me? Um, <laughs> So uh, there's a lot that Simon's covered there. So can I just come back to some of those points? Mm -hmm. um, we don't yet have any monitoring on the quiet ways, so I'm not clear how we can say whether they're a success or not. And the specific question you asked was around minority communities being attracted and I think broadening the base. And, 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 and not just that, new cyclists. Yeah, because a okay. comment was made earlier that to be a cyclist you have to be weird, and quite frankly that is true. I'm a keen cyclist and none of my friends are, are, are waiting for the moment there's a cycle path to join in cycling. They think it's weird that I cycle. What is happening here, quiet ways were meant to help new people cycle yeah. from all walks of yeah. life. Why is that not happening? Well, we can't say it's not happening. I think there's a monitoring report coming out later this year from TfL. The only statistic we have on quiet ways to date is a 50%, 56% increase on quiet way one. Um, quiet Ways kind of evolved from a Greenway programme, which some of you may be aware of. So this was a much less ambitious backstreet canal towpath park programme, mm -hmm. much smaller funding, and we monitored that every year. And um, typically routes attracted more younger people, more older people, two groups underrepresented, more women and more minority community people. So the evidence, again, this has to be evidence-led, is, is that these type of routes, quite direct back streets, do attract those kind of people. I think we need to sit here again in, in a year's time and look at the evidence. Um, I think the problem with the Quiet Way programme is it's, it's taking too long, and that's for all the issues that, that we've discussed here today. Why, why, do, why do boroughs not deliver in the way that we're describing? Why do these issues come up when uh, the long term, you know, it's proven to be a success? It's fear of change. I mean, the people, the, the road space is very obvious to people. Change on the road space is very, very obvious. People are concerned what's going to happen. Um, we could spend a lot more money up front on consultation and the kind of work I described in, in Estrum Road. Um, but ultimately, 95% of London's streets are, are owned by boroughs. 80% of journeys from um, cycles currently happen on those spaces. If we're to make a proper joined up network, we, we have to do this, whether it's Quiet Ways or another program, we have to work with boroughs and we have to do it. Um, there's a evidence, again, going back to evidence, in Auckland, a study in 2014 saying that segregated routes and their boulevards combined had a much greater benefit. Not, neither, neither one is, is the sole answer. No, you know, it's also kind of the Millie Holland approach. I mean, working more on neighbourhoods and wider, wider corridors is, is really useful. So can I just ask the doctor, is there any international... Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. 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 we're all over the place, doctor, this morning. <laughs> is there any um, international evidence around a, a similar scheme as Quiet Ways and its, its ability to pull in new cyclists? Is there any evidence internationally? Um, there isn't, I mean, the, there isn't as much evidence around these kind of schemes as there is around protected bike infrastructure. So there was a study from the United States that um, actually had 
didn't didn't have didn't find evidence of uptake. However, I think part of the problem with that study and the results is the same problem we have. So this was around bicycle boulevards in the US, and bicycle boulevards in the US covers a range of different types of intervention. It doesn't just cover really quiet streets. It also covers, for instance, places where they've put a sign up with a bike on it. So I think part of the problem they had in finding an effect was that you had very different things, and I think that's one of my concerns with the Quiet Way program as well. That we know we we know that people see very very quiet streets as high quality for cycling so people say they will cycle with their kids on a street that has very very little motor traffic but this is not always the case on quiet ways this is not always the case on bicycle mm. boulevards so I think we're not always comparing like with like and we need to set a very high bar this was a point that I wanted to make on this topic that if it's cycle for people cycling with kids my research shows that people will not accept conditions that they might cycle alone, they will not cycle there with kids. So we need really, really quiet streets, we need high quality protected space, and we need routes through parks that are open, um, that, that are always available. And that's not always the case. I think we need to do much more to monitor quality on quiet ways. Mm -hmm. So where you're sharing with motor traffic, what are the motor traffic volumes? What are the motor traffic speeds? What are we guaranteeing people who use those quiet ways? Can we tell them there'll be under 1,000 uh, motor vehicles a day? Can we tell them speeds are under 15 miles an hour? Yeah, we, we can't do that, so it, they need to be monitored. TF, TFL can look at the strategic road network and say, we have a problem here, this isn't working. Why can't they look at the strategic cycle network, including quiet ways, and say, OK, there appears to be a problem with motor traffic volumes on quiet way three? And we can't do this, so actually we need to do a lot more to ensure quality and then I think we will see results. So, um, just very briefly, I was, I was going to come back on, on what Rachel and, and uh, what Matt said. Um, there is, let me be really clear, there is a need for quiet ways. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't believe, uh, Andrew Gilligan, when he spoke here, said essentially they should be completely un, un, unfunded and removed. <laughs> um, I don't believe that we're going to need route links between cycle superhighways. We're going to need links through neighbourhoods. We're going to need links to parks and other amenities. We are going to need quiet areas and quiet routes. Mm -hmm. So it, it's we have to grasp that nest and we have to do it. Um, I think the key here is what I, I don't. I, in a way, I don't care why the boroughs, uh, some of the boroughs, are, are not doing a good enough job. They shouldn't be allowed to do a not good enough job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Rachel talks about quality bar. We advocate a quality bar for funding. So TfL should not be funding quiet ways through boroughs where the borough is not willing to get that quiet way to an adequate uh, level of quality. Because if they don't build it to an adequate level of quality, we won't get more people cycling on there. Just to ask our, our, our other doctor, Ms. Smith. Um, Can I just add to that? Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, this, I'm touching on all those points, you can boil this down to something incredibly simple um, and scarily measurable. Um, and it's one I, I intend to adopt in Manchester, and it's been supported by all the leaders, must be usable by a competent 12-year-old. And it was, okay. um, it was nicked from uh, Sustrans, but it was an epiphany moment when I realised that a competent 12-year-old is somebody who hasn't ridden since school, it's a pensioner, it's somebody with kids. It's a measure that you intrinsically know. If you look at something and say, would I let a competent 12-year-old use this? And if the answer is no, then the person in the car, the pensioner, the people with kids, they're not going to use it. And that is the yardstick uh, that you measure all your interventions by. And I tie that, and I intend to tie that to funding as well. That if we don't meet these standards, then you don't get the funding. Um, and as far on the political sense, uh, it also goes back to the survey data. All the leaders are at each stage agreeing to the rules before we go forward. While we're not in the heat of battle, we're agreeing so consultation above what would we say it's a goer um, as far as standards go we want it to be this standard are we all agreed and then we're all going to hold ourselves accountable retrospectively to that reference and quiet ways it's it, it, the first sentence is intrinsically in conflict you know, for people who are less confident people who are less confident want protected space um, and you know, we already know that and if you can't guarantee that then it's not it's not going to fulfil its purpose. Just to add on to that, I think the, the quality need is just as important with quiet ways or any other sort of non-strategic road route as it is with <coughs> cycle superhighways or whatever might be higher in a, in a pecking order of perception anyway. Uh, any route is only as good as its worst bit. And the reality yep. is that quiet way, let's talk about quiet way type routes, so bringing in Greenway, LCN, LCN Plus, quiet way and so on. There's a massive variety of quality out there in London at the moment, enormous, um, from the best of Quiet Way 1, which I'd say is pretty good, actually, large stretches of that, through to things that 
you know, almost literally throw you under the bus when it gets in any way tricky. Um, so that is, I think, this is this is the battleground where a lot of this will be won and lost ultimately, um, rather than just the superhighways because they cannot, in and of themselves, be enough. Um, and I don't see quite ways as being, you know, necessarily just for people of less confidence. I think the 12-year-old test sounds like a great one, but it, they should be for all users. Um, and my personal cycle journey is I use you know, various bits of it a lot. So the final point is, what is there, for all that it is very variable, quite a lot of it is actually doing quite a lot of heavy lifting. And the data to show that is clearly not there, which I think shows the danger of doing these things without having proper data. So we're unable to properly analyse what the existing infrastructure is or is not doing on these on these back street routes. Um, and some of these back street routes, back street's not necessarily the most helpful label. I mean, they are actually quite direct, quick routes because they follow desire lines for enough cyclists where there isn't a main road that gets you where you want to go. So it's not necessarily about going slowly and safely and sort of bumbling around. Not at all. No. You, you've largely answered my last question, but I, I just want to put this to, to, to Dr Spinney. I, I'm, I'm very interested in people who don't cycle, who are not considering cycling, who, who new so, super cycle highways will make no difference to a decision they'll make. To my mind, that's most of these people we think are going to become cy cyclists if this is all going to work. Is there something else that we could be doing when we're talking about the culture of cycling, the, the infrastructure, particularly quiet ways in this context, to attract those people, to make those people think, actually, I could consider cycling? Um, well, I think firstly it is to come back, I mean, whether, whether we would agree that we can do something there that would encourage those people onto bikes, but what, one of the things perhaps we can do is realise that out of all those potential cycling trips, there will be, you know, groups of people for certain reasons who will not cycle, whatever the quality of infrastructure there. That may be because they work a 12-hour manual shift and they just feel too tired to get on their bike at the end. But what, whatever the reasons happen to be, we need to then have other things in place that are still sustainable in order for those people to make you know, a good decision that is getting them away from their car. So, and one, one of the things I certainly like about the idea of livable neighbourhoods is it takes an emphasis away purely from cycling and, and adds walking and public transport in there a little bit more. Um, because I do believe, even, even though I would, you know, um, I would try and get as many people you know, um, walking and cycling as possible, that there are, out of those 55% of potential cyclable trips, uh, as TfL call it, they're not all actually going to be cycled. Do we have any idea? Because I, I, I see this potential cycling trips, and I, it doesn't feel real to me. Is there any idea how much of that would actually actually be taken up if we had these quiet ways and super cycle, super cycle ways, if we were further advanced and they were good, do we have any idea of how much of that would actually happen? Because we're talking about quite large levels of money here. Yeah, I mean, and I'll, I would be interested, you know, based on TfL's own analysis, whether they can do that themselves is take a lot of the factors they've already got in terms of why people don't cycle, even given some very good infrastructure on their doorstep. I'd be interested to see what dent that makes in mm. those potential cyclable trips. Rachel might be to say something about that. She's probably a bit more au fait with the data, not to put you on the spot if you, if, if you don't. Um, it's just that I would be interested to see um, that 55% sort of disaggregated in, in a way yeah, and worked too. back. It might help boroughs deal with yeah. some of the, because there is great animosity to some of these changes. Again, listen to this conversation. If you were new to this, you, would, you might not understand there is great animosity to putting in these highways. And I, and I wonder if some of this disaggregated um, data would help boroughs in their quest to turn around their quite low delivery. But I, that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Steve, you want to come? Yes, thank you. Thank you. That, that last comment helps me uh, to talk about the, the boroughs. And I, and I speak as someone who's buying his first bike for about 30 years oh, for, for physio reasons. <laughs> I'll probably have one of those ones with a basket and I'll put my dog in and pop the bell. But, however, it, the, the problem with some of these debates is clearly all passionately pro uh, cycling and quite right too. But for the sake of balance, I, I hear some little bit dismissive comments around almost the, the, the boroughs points around this. I'm looking at you, Simon, a little bit because you're, you were the last one making those comments. Um, I mean, we experience uh, in Norbury um, a quiet way to be um, imposed on residents uh, a year or two ago. And it was deeply unpopular. And boroughs do have a responsibility 
to their residents, democracy it is, in, in action, um, to respond to, to, to residents. And I sense here that we are, in, in a way, and naturally, uh, kind of dismissing the boroughs and dismissing local people's feelings around this to push through a, a very good agenda, which is about healthy living. And I just think for the sake of balance, we, we need to consider that um, and consider the fact that local councils and local borough leaders have a responsibility, and I speak as a council, and there's councillors around here, to their residents. And, and, I, and, I, and I hear a little bit of dismissiveness around that, and Simon's going to respond uh, robustly, so, no so doubt. I, yeah, yeah, probably, but, but, but with some sympathy to your point. Um, so I live in Walthamstow, um, and I was involved with the Waltham Forest Mini Holland before the Waltham Forest Mini Holland was a Mini Holland before there was a Mini Holland. Um, <laughs> And, and so I've been on the receiving end of, of much of the ire and, and anger and bike lash that we've seen from residents in, in Walton Forest. Um, and what I would say is that, that I think we have to improve. I, I can understand the concern. And when you, know, when you see residents rising up en masse against a scheme, um, you know, they, they're, 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 they're raising points and that, that has to be listened to. But I think we, we have to kind of separate out you know, how a consultation works and how we listen to people and how we get schemes that are actually really vital for London and that we've all said collectively we want um, on a collective level from when you, it turns up on your street and you're a bit knocked about that, that losing a car parking space or whatever. And it's that disconnect. So we, every survey going, every piece of data we have says people overwhelmingly want more cycling. Um, all across London, people are saying that. They're saying that loud and clear. But when it turns up on their street, when they feel like the council is imposing it, that becomes a huge problem. Um, in in Waltham Forest, we had, we've had multiple what are called villages or villagisation schemes, which are quiet neighbourhoods. Um, the first one of those was incredibly controversial. The second one of those, no one ever talks about. It's <coughs> bigger, it's displaced more motor vehicle traffic, it is a much more ambitious scheme, yet it, it's invisible as far as the public are concerned. And the reason why is because the council dramatically changed the way they consulted and the way they engaged with residents from the first to the second. And in the second one, they had started a real conversation with residents. They said, what do you like about your streets? What do you not like about your streets? Oh, you don't like loads of traffic cutting through your streets. We can do something about that. Then they said, well, this is what we're thinking about doing. Do you like it? What do you not like? Can we shift it? Can we move it? And so they had a conversation with residents. As a result of that, the first scheme was a very tightly fought 44 in favour of the scheme versus 41% against. The second scheme was about 65% in favour. And so the opposition collapsed because people felt listened to. And I think we have to learn how to listen to people, but listen to them without just saying, oh, you don't, you don't like lo losing that parking space, we'll chuck the scheme out. We have to stop doing that. We have to stop backing down at the first sign of any trouble but we have to start having a conversation. I mean, we're going to, no doubt, we'll have one or two other comments because in the next set of questions, which others will lead on, you'll see there's great swathes of the southeast of areas that I represent that there's no cycle schemes. And, that, and that's probably not just because it's unpopular, but because the, those schemes aren't there. Matt, you were going to comment? Yeah, I, I just thought that was really articulate and well. <laughs> I, you know, to, to add to that, it's a perfect example <laughs> of how things change. I think there's a petition in your borough now asking for another village, so it's quite completely yeah. changed. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Norbury <laughs> Avenue. Um, yeah. you know Nodded, didn't you? Yeah. You know so I think anyone who worked on that scheme uh, and found that particularly challenging. But the fact is that the monitoring showed the majority of people on that street in favour of the scheme. Only marginally, the wider community, the, the wider community that uh, used that as a cut through, did not want that to be taken away. So that's a really, really interesting example. And um, we can go into that community and try and convince people of the need for change. But really, the most effective method was for us to get a space, get people from both sides of the argument to come in and talk to each other. Those conversations were super effective. But this requires quite a lot of effort up front. Um, it makes the initial part of delivering the scheme a little bit longer and slower, but it should speed up the second, the second part of the scheme. And no one knows their local community better than people that live there. So, you know, there's stuff we've done on, in terms of putting in pedestrian crossings or narrowing footway or some trees or some um, seating that make the space better that has come from, from that community. So vital to engage. Okay. I like Simon's view on, on asking the consultation. It's a bit like an EU referendum. You keep asking the question until you get the right answer. But I say that in a tongue in, tongue in cheek. Chair, yeah, thank you. That's thank a, you very oh, much. Last comment on that one. No, I like that one. Very good. Okay, so we're now going to look at um, after London and we look to Caroline. Chair. Yes, um, we've 
I've covered quite a lot of this already, but broadly, um, we've got a situation in London where um, the majority of the investment has been in inner London, where 70 out of 73 of TfL's um, Better Junctions um, program have been in inner London. Um, the majority of the money has been spent on inner London, and um, yet we've got the analysis of cycling potential that shows 14 of the outer boroughs having the most potential. So if we can focus in a bit on outer London, and my sort of opening question is, you know, what are the different cycling infrastructure needs of outer London compared to inner and central <coughs> London? So who would like, Richard, we'll start at that start, so um, here I'd, I'd encourage you to think of cycling infrastructure as including the bikes themselves. So I mean their cycle hire, whether it's fixed or floating, uh, dockless or docked, um, which is not the only answer for outer London, as we've said, all these things, it's, it's a blend, but given all the stats you just reeled off, where clearly the fixed infrastructure priorities have been central and inner London, that's not going to turn around overnight. So quicker things that can happen, to my mind, include access to the bikes themselves, which certainly is a barrier to cycling. Uh, as I say, it's, not, it's a necessary but not sufficient. Um, and there, I think, um, the, the role of Dockless in particular, probably, in reality, given the time scales and the money involved with, with fixed, with cycle hire, uh, that's interesting stuff. And when you look at the take-up rates that have happened in some other cities, that are starting to happen in some of the areas of London, again, mostly central and inner, that do have dockless bike already. I think there's something there that's, uh, that's positive. Got to be done in the right ways, which is not necessarily entirely simple, but I think can be done. Um, but I think there's, there's something to look at there. I think there's also something, slightly going back to the previous question, there's something about, about genuine conversations and consultation and getting into the attitudes underlying lack of cycle use, lack of interest in or resistance to cycling and what really lies behind that. Not all of those conversations will be successful ones that will turn it around, but I suspect some of them, Simon's points about Walthamstone and so on, actually, you know, some of those conversations can be turned around. And that finally takes me back to the data bit. This is where having some data, even just on the potential, is extremely important and then seeing some things happen on the ground extracting the best possible data out of that so again tfl working with any party that's got relevant data here to help prove the case to help shift those conversations off perceptions and into realities do you mean you use the data to actually help the community to understand both if you talk of it in terms of sides i mean to help both sides so I mean the community, absolutely, but also whoever is seeking to make an intervention, whether that's to put in a fleet of bikes or to put in a bike lane, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, just since you've raised dockless bike hire, that was something I was going to come to sort of at the end of this section, but since you've already um, raised it, do you, is there any evidence that they're being used a lot? Because um, we've certainly got two different dockless bike hire sets of bikes um, around Islington um, over the last few months. And I haven't seen a lot of people using them there, kind of rains jump, and there seems to be a bit of a Friday night thing of knocking them all over and people picking them up again. Um, but have you, have you um, come across much evidence about how much they're being used and whether they really are helping more people use So I, I haven't got any specific take-up figures to... Um, to throw back at you, the operators clearly will have that data. Mm, um, they are um, the ones that are already live in London, the other ones who are seeking to be live in London, clearly see the potential, otherwise why would they be bothering? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there is, of course, again, the chicken and egg thing of having a sufficient fleet of bikes, and the, there are multiple operators in this market, so fleets of bikes that make it work for people. So, a bit like all kinds of cycling infrastructure, you do need to get to some sort of critical mass level to, I think, really see uptake then start to, to, to grow strongly. Um, nonetheless, my understanding is it's been pretty positive in London so far, and certainly in other UK cities and other global cities, it's been extremely positive. So the, the two big operators have been you know, approaching 200 cities worldwide, millions of daily hires, millions of bikes, and so on. So, at that top level, it works. I mean, we, we've we've just 
the, the other sort of issue with the use of these Doppler bikes is the fact that they're constrained to particular boroughs. Mm. Do you think that there needs to be more um, pan London, you know, so that you can, we heard earlier about the people wanting to make those trips that don't go in and out of the centre. Yep. So if that's where the potential is for people using these bikes, then doesn't that suggest that there needs to be a kind of a, a joined up approach so that they can be used to make those trips that people seem to want to make and at the moment are making by car? Yes, in a word. I mean, I think the potential is orbital and radial, um, but the, co the borough coordination need, again, comes back here strongly uh, and it's something I'm trying to make a bit of headway on. Um, you have these competitors in the market, which is a healthy thing. You also, to some degree, have a coordination need, I think. You don't want to have streets swamped with bikes, and equally, you don't want to have bike deserts. And clearly, there's, you know, people don't cycle by borough boundary. Um, so what they don't need is a borough with lots and lots of bikes, absolutely nothing, and then not much, and then lots, and, uh, you know, a patchwork. And we've heard in other kinds of cycling infrastructure, that doesn't work very well. Um, so there is clearly a coordination need here. It is difficult because of London's governance landscape that it has, but nonetheless, the, you know, the need is there. Does anyone else want to come in on the Dockless? Yes, lots. Um, Chris. Well, we've um, got a, an experiment running in Manchester at the moment with, uh, with Mobike, um, and it's a very, very steep learning curve, and I have a complete fascination uh, with this particular mode of, of um, well, not just a bike, but this particular type of scheme because it, it speaks to the, the point I made earlier about easy. Uh, it, it is so easy, it is such a clever idea. Um, it's very Uber-like, um, both potentially pluses and negatives, I was say, don't put us off it, <laughs> some well, of us. <laughs> the, the, I mean, the fact that I can open a, a smart, an app and yeah. say, right, there's a bike 50 metres from me, I reserve it, I walk over there, I get on it, I ride it to where I want to go, I get off it, and I'm done, park it responsibly, and I'm done. That's very, very attractive to me yes. as a user. It's cost me 50p <coughs> for half an hour. That's very attractive. That's very enabling. Uh, it is a local journey. The longer journeys, they're not built for it. You know, they've got an exponential energy requirement for speed ratio. Once you get to 10 miles an hour, you are Olympic standard. So they are very <laughs> short journey tools. Um, but in this day and age, uh, something that is free for a local council, um, I'm aware of yeah. the numbers that it costs it to it even after sponsorship for the DOT scheme here, completely free, is an absolute godsend. Uh, the downside is, is its freedom, is that the bikes can go anywhere. Uh, vandalism is a real problem uh, that has to be faced. You mentioned bikes being pushed over, um, a lot worse than that. And that's a real challenge because it's such uh, a potentially potent tool, a real enabler. And you mentioned joined up as well. If you create the space, then give people the tools to use it and have sufficient saturation that in the, when I go to work in the morning, I am confident that I will look outside the door, I'll look at the app and I'll know within 100 metres of me there's going to be a bike. I will have a way to get to work that I can depend on. It's a real enabler. Um, and as far as controlling it goes, one of the things that we're discussing now with Mobike, they have a point scheme, so you start with 100 points. Uh, the infringement rules, you lose points, it gets more expensive to, or, or to the point you become blocked and you can't use the scheme anymore. Um, but if we can actually make that slightly more proactive and say, well, if I go out of my area, I know I'm going to pay a penalty, I'm going to lose some points. But if I put it back in a preferred area, I gain some points, and it treats people like adults. That's very interesting. And the way the technology is built, they have the flexibility to change things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think they're a huge, uh, they have huge potential for the future. Can I just come in on that? So, um, I mean, I've, I've spent the last year or so doing some research on public bikes in Shanghai uh, and also keeping tabs on the, um, e, uh, the ECF's um, public European bike sharing um, kind of symposia and collective. Um, and is to sound a bit of a note of caution uh, on these based on that, of course, we're in the early days of this technology, this particular initiative, but... Um, I think certainly um, is not to completely discourage it, but we're seeing it rolled out in Manchester, in Sheffield, in Newcastle, Bristol, Norwich, various cities. I'm hoping to get around to do some research in these places soon, particularly to see what kind of agreements are being put in place between the municipality mm. and the operator. Our experience in Shanghai, we were of course at their peak, there was about 30 
of these operators all competing yeah. with a peak of about one and a half million bikes. So that's about 16 bikes for every resident. Uh, uh, no, sorry, one, one bike for every 16 residents of Shanghai. Um, so a real kind of saturation there. Um, so there's a number of issues to flag there. One of them is the issue of data uh, in terms of if we look at who's actually backing these schemes, it's internet giants, Baidu and Tencent. Uh, why are these schemes being kind of rolled out? Is it because they believe in sustainable mobility solutions or is it because they want to harvest user data? And, and how long is this going to kind of last if they realise they can't make any money out of that data? So um, there's that issue. There's also an issue in terms of data sharing. These bikes are GPS enabled. They are a valuable resource about where people cycle in cities. But at the moment, it's unclear how much of that data is being given back to the municipalities. Chris might better say something about um, the agreements they've come to in Manchester on that. So um, there's a real issue there in terms of data sharing. And certainly in the London context, I think um, any agreements need to be clear about you know, who, who has ownership of that data. Is it the private operator? How is it going to be leveraged? Um, also, to, you, know, you, you, you've, you have a question here in terms of would it be better to have a more competitive model for dockless bike hire schemes, multiple operators? Well, um, for a number of reasons, I would suggest the less operators, the better. From the user perspective in Shanghai, we've seen that most users only are signed up to one or two operators. Um, you don't want a phone full of 30 different uh, apps, each one for a different sort of bike operator. So in the London context, with each borough having a different operator could be quite problematic. In terms of integration with other kind of ticketing, the less operators, the better. And in terms of just a broader sustainable mobility plan, uh, trying to coordinate with 33 different public bike operators in order how, the, how, how do they fit into TfL's broader uh, sort of master plan becomes more problematic. So there's a number of reasons why we should be cautious with these things. Not to dismiss it, of course, as Chris says, I think the flexibility of these schemes is fantastic. Did you want to come back on... Yeah, I mean, I'm aware that Rachel wants to, to come in as well. I think um, the future is, is almost certainly going to be some form of franchising. So you want that competition, which is very useful for negotiating, for getting the best deals, for keeping people motivated. But I personally wouldn't like to see lots and lots of different operators either. Uh, it's nice when you have a brand and this is, you see orange in the distance or you see yellow and you know right, that's a higher bike and you go that direction. I think that's good. But to have the potential for competition, I think, is also very healthy. Um, and there's an awful lot of learning to be done here. Um, and I think if we ask the same question in a year, there'll be an awful lot more, um, a much richer response to be able to give you. But I definitely think it's, it's the future. Yeah, just very briefly and following on from that, then definitely some coordination is needed. And ideally, it'd be nice if there was one app across the whole of London. That would also facilitate data sharing and potentially facilitate pricing um, incentives. So one thing I've been um, floating is the idea of a freedom pass for cycling, whereby older people could just pick up a bike and use it for free. And having that integration would facilitate that. Just a second quick point. In the United States, they've looked at bike share equity and the role of bike share in getting uh, underrepresented communities community cycling and they found that um, good quality cycle hire along with bike infrastructure can help um, improve some of those um, some of their income based inequality so potentially bike share has a role in improving participation as well in fact, sorry, can I just add to, add to that very quickly? Um, I think one of the things we could probably do, particularly to increase cycling in outer London, if these schemes are being rolled out, is a stipulation perhaps for these operators to supply non-standard cycles. You know, things like cargo bikes, things like trikes as well, in order, because there are huge barriers of entry in terms of the cost of those kind of vehicles, where if they are freely available, we might start seeing uh, a more diverse group of people cycling uh, and at very minimal cost to the borough. And we can expect electric uh, dockless bikes probably this year, which is very exciting. Really? From all companies? or Well, uh, we've had some kind of discussions with some, uh, yeah. and, and it's been thought about and developed. I mean, clearly it comes with some new challenges that need to be worked through. But, yeah, that, that's an exciting development. I have five apps on my phone for bike hire. It's not user-friendly. <laughs> but there seems to be some di the different companies in London doing different things. So we're like a test bed right now. It's pretty exciting. So you're mm. kind of Urbo looking at North East, um, O-Bike and others in the centre. So, and some of those models charge a fee, 
uh, mm -hmm. joining fee because they do something different with the data. I'd really like to understand what happens to my data, the point that Justin made. Yep. Yes, yeah, so the idea of um, Rachel saying one app would oh, kind of really, really simplify yeah, things yeah. down. Can I take us back to the original question, which um, Richard took us off into Dockless Bikes, but the original question was, what are the different cycling infrastructure needs of outer London compared to inner and central London? Um, Simon's got his hand up. So I, I saw a presentation from a Dutch planner a while ago, and, and this really kind of this was my light bulb moment, was, was that the Dutch plan their suburban conurbations <coughs> on a, a two kilometer walking radius and a six kilometer cycling radius. Um, so essentially, mode, mode trips for walking drops off after about 2K. Most people, and that, that holds true in, in London and in most of the UK, most of the world probably. Um, so most people don't like walking more than 2K. Most people don't like cycling more than, than 6K. Um, so the, the routes and the cycle superhighways we see at the moment and, and the, the routes that run from inner London to central London um, are quite often used for commuting trips by people who are willing to ride actually more than 6K quite often. Um, so we have outliers who are the cycling population at the moment. Um, in the future, we, will, we should be planning for a cycling population that doesn't cycle 15K to, to work, um, as I do every day. Um, so, so for that population in outer London, they're not going to ride, you're not going to ride from Barnet to central London, you're not going to ride from Walthamstow probably to central London, but you are going to ride to your nearest train station, you are going to ride to the tube, you're going to ride to the shops. Um, so your planning should be very similar. We should still see cycle tracks on main roads. We should still see quiet neighbourhoods. We should still see quiet ways. We should see all of the technology and tools and, and approaches that we see already, but we should be planning not necessarily to funnel all those people into central London. We should be funnelling them to, to amenities, to train stations, transport hubs, etc. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, can I? Um, yes, uh, I mean, that was one of the things that I was going to pick up on, is that, that sense of these journeys um, from the outer boroughs are going to be too long uh, for most people. So there's, there's a focus in, it, in, the, um, in the analysis of cycling potential, I guess. One of the things, um, perhaps uh, it's not the place to have it in that document, but it's more of a focus on interchange. The focus on interchange in that document was much more um, around providing cycle parking there, but those places can be so much more than that. If they have meaningful retail, if they have nurseries, dentists, doctors, then we can reduce the need to travel, or we can at least make sure that people are perhaps making less, less trips. So that idea of those station interchanges as a real hub. So it's not just about the density, increasing the density of those areas, it's about cre increasing the kind of diversity of those areas as well. The, join in with that for my, sorry, the, um, Integrating it with the public transport network is undoubtedly one very strong point, particularly on the radial going into town flow. It's remarkably difficult, I think, still to get around out of London radially. To get from the bit of out of London you're in to the next door bit is often quite hard work, apart from in a car. And that is partly why a car is easily the dominant share in out of London. I think cycling and walking have a real role in the healthy streets most transport strategy agenda in starting to in continuing to turn that around really so a look at how you can get by cycle which includes the infrastructure includes the bikes themselves and all these other points we've been making to those nearest hubs and adjacent ones is partly where the strategic analysis takes us already i think that starts to show that data that potential um, but i think that could then be seen to be helping both tfl and boroughs potentially with some of the issues they've got. So in a world where public transport is never going to be as good in outer London as in inner and central, because public transport needs density to work really well, and there isn't much money for new public transport, and you want to cut down on car transport, <laughs> then I think looking at what can be done uh, you know, with relative levels of funding for cycling and walking is a must. I'm surprised no one's talked about the massive main roads in out of London because um, certainly we've recently done a um, study on outer London junctions and one of the things that we saw were you know huge huge community severing roads where people would say that actually it was easier to drive to cross the road than it was to walk down the road to find a bridge to cross the north circular and then walk back mm. on the other side of the road to end up on the other side of where they'd started and um, just yes. Does anyone want to pick up on that at all, M Matt and then Rachel? Uh, 
Uh, so, yeah, I, I came to one of those um, sessions with you stood under a massive flyover in, in Rumford. They, they, it, it's there with are, Keith. <laughs> out of, yeah, with Keith as well. Outer London is, is, is different. I mean, it's much bigger. The change that the MTS requires has to happen in Outer London. The severance there is much greater. Um, so there's a huge amount of work to be done to overcome those barriers and to deal with those junctions. Um, but ultimately, the, the type of infrastructure that's needed is the same as in inner London, so protection where the roads are busy and uh, decent high quality back streets. Just to add to this, um, the bulk of the work we deliver is in outer London, um, and I think we've had quite a lot of success working with a, a kind of community, a particularly defined area, um, changing their streets. And this isn't coming at it from a cycling perspective, this is improving your environment, and one of the outcomes of that is a, a better place to cycle and walk. So we did that in Mark's Gate, where there was um, an issue with speed, people coming through a very small community in Barking and Dagenham at 80 miles an hour. Residents were concerned about that. They didn't come to us saying, you know, we want more cycling. They came to us saying, this is just too hostile. Uh, but one of the outcomes, one of the things we're able to do is say, well, how about you, you travel, you know, how about you walk more journeys? How about you cycle more journeys? There's a crossrail station opening just down there. It's a 50 minute bike ride away, and that opens up all access into, into London. So the point is a, a big kind of engagement with communities in a very focused area with a kind of healthy streets hat on rather than a transport hat. That actually follows on quite nicely because I wanted to say something about safety and that is such a big issue in outer London. It's not really recognised because you don't have so high cycling rates in outer London so you don't have as many deaths and injuries as you do in central London but actually if you look at risk per cyclist then you find something quite interesting which is um, some outer London boroughs have injury odds per cyclist up to seven times higher than central and inner boroughs. So actually injury risks per kilometre cycled are sometimes much higher in outer London but we're not taking account of that because the fact that few people cycle mean we don't get the numbers of deaths and serious injuries and it's actually completely unfair and it's very serious because we know that injury risks in central London are substantially higher than they should be they're higher substantially higher than the Netherlands so if you think of the fact that injury risks for people cycling in outer London are several times higher than that again you know there is a reason why people in outer London are not cycling and they one of the reasons why they're not cycling is that they are probably quite realistically perceiving that there is a danger on these hostile roads. Thank you. There was a report from London councils about the way the population is changing and changing much quicker than it has in the past with this movement from inner to outer London. I just wonder how the Walthamstow project was affected by people who were priced out of inner London mm -hmm. and had an expectation yeah. that they would be able to cycle and walk uh, in a much more comfortable environment because that's what they'd experienced in, in the centre. So, you know, I'm optimistic, but I think that that is a, a benefit. That brings us beautifully on to the Mini Holland programme, which Simon has already very eloquently described the consultation processes and you know what um, Waltham Forest has, has learnt from that. Does anyone have any other lessons that you think that we should be learning from the Mini Holland's programme? Uh, Simon's hand straight up again. Well, I, I mean, I've lived, I've lived this project, so uh, you know, for, for its entire from before its inception all the way through, and I'm still very heavily involved in, in the Wolf Forest Mini Holland. I'm also very involved in the, the Enfield Mini Holland, really now as well. Um, and and I, I think the simple answer is that every single project that is worth generates controversy. Um, there is always going to be a bike lash, um, and and you have to face it. You have to have that political leadership, but then at the end of it, that bike clash dies away. Um, you know, in Walter Forest, w there, is, there is no controversy left. There are a tiny handful of people who are still quite bitter and angry about, about uh, the Mini Holland. The vast majority of people who were angry about Mini Holland are now angry about Brexit or the collapse of the NHS or various other things. Um, so um, so, so that, 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 that bike clash dies away, but what's left, and particularly both in Enfield and, and Walter Forest, are schemes that, that really threaten the status quo, that have really taken space away from private motor vehicles, but the results are fantastic. You know, we're, we're seeing initial results from Walter Forest and from Enfield that really are valuable, I think, and show this can be done. It can be done in outer London, it can be done anywhere in London, um, and the results are great, so we have to do more of it. You know, and I, and I think it, the, the political leaders in, in both, particularly, again, I'm gonna say Enfield and Walter Forest, have really faced a lot of flack um, and they've had to face down a lot of flack, but the results at the end, I think, are worth it. Um, so I, I, that's my key learning from, from Mini Holland, is anyone who hasn't been to the A105 scheme, anyone who hasn't been to Leibridge Road, anyone who hasn't been to the village or the Black Horse Village should get out there and have a look at what's, what's happening out there, because it is radical. 
you know, and worth it. Anyone else like to come in on Rachel? Um, yeah, just to, to follow on from that, because I've been involved in ongoing evaluation of the Mini Holland scheme. So the evaluation is ongoing, the scheme is still ongoing, but just to, to let you know, we have some interim findings that are very promising um, and actually, you know, earlier than you might expect to find them. And this is in terms of both behaviour, both walking and cycling, and also attitudes. Um, so that there are indeed yeah, positive, um, positive signs that interventions do have an impact. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say was in terms of the, um, the results, we're finding stronger results in areas that actually had interventions, not just mini Holland boroughs per se, but actually those areas within the boroughs that did have the interventions, the, the modal filtering, the neighbourhood schemes and so on. So um, it kind of makes sense because these are things that are going in right in people's immediate neighbourhoods and they see them and they then are potentially more likely to walk and cycle. But, you know, I, I, maybe it's obvious, but it's kind of... Yeah, nice to see it. Just quickly for me, I, I don't think there's anything startling that came out of it. Um, there's stuff we knew, but I think the detail and how the borough dealt with it, there's a lot of learning at that level. So we knew there'd be opposition. The learning is at how that was uh, uh, overcome. So they did a great job in both those two boroughs on comms very early. With comms, I think you've talked about that really clearly. Um, I think Waltham Forest brought a group of experts in very early, so not relying on perhaps a traditional um, transport engineering approach was very strong. Uh, and it just shows you what can happen when you're working in one local authority and you have political support, again, reinforcing that point. Simon. I was just going to add very quickly, which is that... Oh, no, I've completely forgotten. <laughs> okay. We have one final question here, which is, are there lessons, for, are there particular lessons from the Mini Hollands that should be informing the Mayor's livable neighbourhood schemes, which are, have got, they've got less money, um, so what, what, do they, what do they need to learn from Mini Holland? Simon, go for it. And then it actually ties into what I just remembered I was going to say. So the first thing I think is, is uh, that they have to be bold, they have to be brave, and, and they have to really be willing to face controversy. And, and I, I would argue, again, that, that any scheme that's worth it probably is going to cause some backlash and some controversy. Um, I think the other thing is, and, and this plays to a general point about the whole and not just livable neighbours, um, which I was going to make, is there is, a, there is I, I'm, I think, London Cycling Campaign, we're, we're absolutely behind the Healthy Streets agenda. We think the healthy streets agenda is great. But there is a really important lesson to be learned from many Hollands and about healthy streets, which is that cycling plays a really important part in, in that process. Um, it is, you know, I, I think there is a risk that some boroughs will look at healthy streets and livable neighbours and see walking and public transport. And these are popular modes that are very easy to do something for. Um, but the growth, if we, if we are to hit the mayor's ambitions to get 80% active travel by, by 2041, the growth in, in mode share is going to be in cycling. The, the vast majority of trips need to come from cycling. We're not going to see explosive growth in bus usage. We're not going to see expl explosive growth in pedestrians um, and walking rates. We are going to see it in cycling. So, so what's really key for the Mini Hollands is that good cycling schemes turn out to be most often good walking schemes, good community schemes, good neighbourhood schemes, um, if they're done right but also that cycling is an intrinsic part of that. If we try and make schemes that are just about walking and ignore cycling, I think the Liberal Neighbours programme will go quite badly wrong. Mm -hmm. Chris. Just on the, um, when I first saw the Liverpool streets, Liverpool neighbourhoods, I really liked that as a, as a tool to engage more people and to stop this tribalisation mm -hmm. uh, of transport methods, and I really like it. But I was going to echo exactly the same note of caution that it can be used to not do things as well. Um, and I think that's really important that we don't lose the steel of how you would achieve that. Um, the, when you mentioned before the, the two and six kilometres, um, that's a great rule that seems to stand the test wherever you are, probably in the world, definitely in the country. People will walk 2K, they'll ride 6K, but then there's a big drop off to enthusiasts for anything more than that. Um, accept that and see what, what that lets you achieve. And linking up to public transport is, is the obvious one, rather than trying to link it to central London. Mm. But they, the, the healthy streets, healthy neighbourhoods approach, used carefully, I think, is an excellent way to uh, to engage more people, to make it about kids' schools, their health, uh, and to allow people will accept more change. I think it's a really good approach if used carefully. Great. Only point to add, if I might, is, um, is the role of business and engaging with businesses in mm. these local areas. 
um, which I think is the need for quality is there in terms of what the interventions are and it's there for in how consultation is done with the community and the community includes businesses. And I think business attitudes on, on some of these schemes can be you know, quite important arbiters of some of the local dynamics as to whether there is support or there isn't support or whether initially there's opposition but that turns into support to whatever degree, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a role there. Just two points. One follows on from that, and that is something that I was going to mention because potentially to engage with business, to think about how um, demand might change. So an example from a restaurant um, in a particular scheme where the demand changed. It didn't go down, but it meant that customers were coming at the weekend rather than weekday lunchtime, for instance. So if the businesses have been engaged thinking about those kind of issues, you need to change staff shift patterns, you need to think about what you provide. So I think more travel demand planning with businesses is good. But my other point was around monitoring and evaluation, and that's the livable neighbourhoods um, scheme is really promising, but I, I, so far I, I haven't seen anything around a standardised evaluation framework. I think Transport for London should be doing more to encourage boroughs to collect and share data, you know, cycle counts, intercept service. It doesn't all have to be expensive stuff, but it needs to be done in a standardised way. It should be shared, and we could do a lot more with routine and relatively cheaply collected data. So I think that needs to be, that needs to be done. TfL could take more of a role there. Very much agree with that. Uh, Carolyn. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up the conversation earlier about um, Mobikes. I think, Chris, you said you'll have, you've got in Manchester across your, your boroughs. Um, are you getting access to the data that they're collecting? Um, I'm not au fait with that at the moment. I, I'm aware of it, but I think I chose to bundle it up under franchise. One of the conditions would be that these are the terms that we would like you to engage you as the operator of choice for this period of time. Um, I think we'll need to potentially strengthen some local um, local law that we can actually make sure that we only have one operator. Um, I don't know if that's something that's being looked at here to, to try and keep a rein on it and stop, stop bikes cluttering the street. But I would say that the data um, could be part of that franchise process. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, Simon, you said that uh, if the mayor's to hit to his target by 2041, I think it was, he has to focus more on cycling than walking. Did I answer, did I answer this right? And, and if you did say that, why did you say that? So I, I wouldn't say he has to focus more on cycling than walking. I think both modes are absolutely vital to, to, to improve, to understand, um, to plan for. But the, in terms of the number of trips uh, and in terms of the growth rates, then the, the TfL's own, own predictions and, and the mayor's predictions are that, that the growth is going to come from cycling. So essentially a lot of the trips that, particularly in central London, this is less true for outer London, but, but, but a lot of the trips that currently could be walked, that there is potential to, to be walked, are walked. I, if, if you're going to go 2K in central London, you try and get on a bus, you get off the bus because the bus isn't going anywhere anyway, so then you walk. Um, whereas we have a, a much larger, of, of the kind of pie, of the, of the, 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 the chunk of stuff that, that is currently driven, is currently done by motorised modes, that we want to shift over to being active travel. Cycling is the area where we can grow much more. I mean, there's also great emphasis that we should be encouraging more walking, say, to schools, right, and the yeah. safer pathways. And, and, I, and I'm really encouraged that this mayor appointed a, a cycling and walking commissioner. Yeah rather than just a cycling commission. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just add to that, that. I think the two do go together if you're very careful that you, you, don't, yeah. you don't water down the cycling aspect. But uh, I think that the schools very, is very poignant. 30% uh, of journeys in Greater Manchester made by car are less than one kilometre. And yeah. it's a figure that's roughly reflected across the country, which is unbelievable. The flip side, of course, is the potential there is enormous. So when you look at what would actually make people want to walk, it's the same thing. The two things can be addressed together, cycling and walking, because they're the junctions, they're the things, would I let my 12-year-old walk to school? Or what would, what would make me? Well, I know that they're safe, I know that they've got the route they're going to go is protected all the way. Um, and traffic speed's a big one. I mean, 20 miles an hour is painful to drive at, but it makes an enormous difference, not just to safety in the event of an accident, but the perception of a street. So if we can actually get not just 20 mile an hour signs, but a 20 mile an hour speed, the difference between would you let your children walk to school or not is enormous. So it actually affects the whole, uh, whole community. So going back to DFT, I think there's one of the things I'd be very <coughs> interested in. Uh, uh, this is very speculative at this stage, but uh, the local enforcement of 20 mile an hour zones. 
so we can actually make it work and then put the money back into that community and possibly into that into that street and road to get around the political aspect of this is just about making money. Well, yes, it is, but here's where that money's gone. So we can actually get 20 miles an hour. Uh, but that, that may need some central government action to, to allow that to happen. It may possibly even decriminalise 20 miles an hour uh, as a speed limit, so we can enforce it locally, but find some mechanism. And it's something that we know works, we know it enhances a neighbourhood, um, people locally want it, but at the moment it's not happening by putting a sign up and very few police forces are enforcing it or have the resource to do so. Thank you. Y yes. I was just going to add, you know, again, one of the experiences from the Wolf Forest Mini Holland is, is good cycling infrastructure, is generally good walking infrastructure as well. That's the, that's the other yeah. thing, you know, is we can improve the pavement, but that doesn't do anything for cycling and therefore we're not going to get the growth rates. But if we improve... Uh, if we remove through traffic, for instance, in the neighbourhood, as we've seen in North Forest they've done, then it's not just the cycling rates that go through the roof, it's the walking rates as well. So we really, you know, again, it's a case of saying we should be planning for walking and cycling and public transport, but we should make sure that each of those modes is, is really considered, not just walking or public transport or even just cycling, you know. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we now move on to the final section, which is Joanne. Living just off the A105 in Enfield, I can say it's a much nicer walking experience as well down my local high street. Um, but I want to ask about cycle parking. And eight years ago, I did a report into cycle parking because that was identified as one of the major barriers why people didn't get on their bikes if there was nowhere to securely um, leave them and lock them when they were um, going about their cycle journeys. So my first question really is an open one, is that is there sufficient cycling, cycle parking in London or what more needs to be done? So I'll just start with Simon. <laughs> no, it's, there is not. There is not. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of your later questions, you talk about kind of uh, park, you know, cycle parking, we, what we call fly parking which is parking on lampposts and railings and, 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 and things like that. Um, and that, you know, we see that all over London, and that is evidence of suppressed demand for cycle parking, or unfulfilled demand for cycle parking. There are also loads of locations where there's just no cycle parking at all, and people don't cycle. So um, I think cycle parking is tied to infrastructure, it's tied to cycle rates. The more infrastructure we have, the more people feel comfortable cycling, the more cycle parking we need. Um, but we also need lots of cycle parking just generally everywhere, and we're not getting it. Um, and I think particularly train stations and, and, and uh, transport hubs is one of the, I mean, you know, uh, so my colleague Tom Bogdanovich uh, sits on uh, the, the Cycle Rail Awards, uh, and, and every year he, he, you know, he's depressed at how little innovative work has been done on rail stations across the whole of the UK, but in London as well, mm -hmm. and how much cycle parking they have, and, and you know, secure hubs, and the amount of parking that's been added. So, so we really have an, an issue across the board. Cycle parking is, is you know, is a massive issue. Um, the London plan has has improved matters with new developments, but even there, we're still, you know, we're still pushing very hard to see more um, into the new the new London plan. Um, and particularly, there isn't a consideration of how good the cycle parking is. Um, both on street quality yeah so both on the street in terms of how convenient it is but how you know how the stands are, are constructed but then secure parking how easy it is to access um, and then things like for instance the numbers of cycle parking where you have a development which is downstairs retail upstairs housing so the london plan dictates upstairs what happens in the flats what happens in the houses whatever above above the retail and it dictates for employees but it doesn't necessarily dictate how much ambient on-street cycle parking there'll be around around businesses so again th there's a real gap here to, to provide a lot more basically across the board and one of my recommendations last time was that tfl with conjunction with cycling groups undertook an award level audit to see where the current cycling provision was and where it was needed i understand that's taking part place with you is that right yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, it's not my area of expertise, but yes, I understand that is somewhat ongoing. Okay. Well, looking at those issues, does anyone like to come in? Perhaps start with train stations. One of the recommendations I made last time was about putting it into a franchise agreement. Um, is that something that anyone else is looking at, or any other yeah. ideas about <laughs> train stations? We're, we're talking to a couple of train operating co companies at the moment around 
franchising, and that's part of um, their discussion with us. So they seem to be increasingly keen on the last mile uh, and making sure that you know there's a secure place to leave the bike. So I think the political mood around that is being heard, um, and yeah, we're driving that forward. So that is an opportunity. I mean, clearly, TfL in London have a great opportunity to promote the cycling. Uh, cycle parking at, at, at stations and tube stations, and I think TfL have to deliver 10,000 houses. Um, so there's a great opportunity there. Um, the big thing for me is the West End. I, I picked up this suit recently and cycled down and couldn't couldn't park anywhere. But there's still uh, car parking in that space. It seems extraordinary. Um, and then yeah, but there's the, on the positive. There's now an increasing number of car parking spaces being taken out and replaced with bike hangers that can um, take mm -hmm. eight bikes. I don't see that in my area now to London, but I see that increasingly in inner London, so there are some reasons to be positive. It's only worth saying, I think, it's, it has moved on a lot in London in the last few years, but equally it's clearly got a long, long, long way to go. You've only got to go to a Scandinavian rail station and experience cycle parking there to understand you know, some of the, the gap where we might be thinking about closing. On the rail station bit, I think that there's another thread that goes back to DFT, clearly. Um, and the, you know, particularly in a London context, yeah. if we're thinking of the main termini, those are all network rail managed. Network rail is now formally part of DFT, therefore, and DFT will also let the franchises, the train operating companies, so those, those roads meet there. Um, just to stress the quality point at rail stations in particular, but far from just that, you know, not all cycle parking is created equal, and you, you do sometimes see cycle, official cycle parking that is not quite full, and yet fly parking to these. Simon's term. Now that to me is an indicator that people at the margins there are choosing that lamppost rather than the actual cycle stand. But then when you look at the conditions in those cycle stands, you start to understand why that might be the case. In other words, can you put your bike in there easily and can you get it out easily and will it be in the same condition that you put it in? Those are actually real considerations for cyclists all the time when parking. So the, the quality of it really does matter. The, ultimately, data again here so that you know the analysis is again a step forward here to show you the you know the potential clearly mapping that against the provision existing and then thinking about the potential is the way to go and my understanding is that um, network rail is obliged to get maximum revenue from the space it has which would require um, so sort of lean from the DFT to say actually the cycle park you can might but it's also worth thinking so with some of the doctors bike operators where they have virtual docking stations so it's a sort of hybrid between the you know the fixed up in the ground yeah. and but areas where you're meant to drop the bikes and so on part of their point is that they can utilize space that isn't really very much used at the moment they're not very space hungry so it might be a revenue issue with NR or are there some places where there's a solution where actually NR aren't going to get any revenue from that spot anyway but you could put some decent cycle parking into it and in any case, of course, there is the link between better cycle yeah. parking and more revenue, people spending in shops, okay. etc. That was another of my recommendations, actually. Put it side by side with the docking stations. But Simon, can I come back to you? Because you said about um, look, boroughs being more open to putting cycles against railings or lampposts. But of course, TfL has a policy of trying to move um, railings wherever possible and increasing use of shared space and um, roadways is that proving difficult for cyclists or not I don't I mean I don't think that the removal of guard railing and, and things like that is is so rapid and so kind of intense that, that it's 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 proving a problem uh, uh, my view you know is that actually we, we shouldn't be you know we, we should be seeing every time we see a bike parked on a railing we should be thinking well where's the nearest stand how many stands are there can we put some more stands in there's clearly demand at this location we should do more at this location we shouldn't be penalizing and i think you know matt's point about central london is a really good point you know there are whole swathes of central london where it's impossible to find anywhere to park and every railing is covered with a sign that says if you park you know your bike on this railing you will your bike will be removed and and so really you're kind of you know it's a it's a double blow we should be saying, you know, we should be saying that responsible parking, you know, if you're not blocking the footway, we should just allow that generally. Um, and if, if uh, you know, if we're seeing lots of parking on railings, that should be just an, an indication of more desire at that point. 
um, whether that's a building railing or guard railing or whatever. You know, and, and certainly when there's a scheme coming through where the guard railing is being removed, obviously at that point, you know, TfL or the local borough should be thinking very carefully. Well, if there's 20 bikes already on this railing and we're taking this railing out, where are those 20 bikes going to go? You know. Okay. Can I ask? Um, Richard, you've mentioned Scandinavia and train stations, but is there any other examples from across the world with regards to cycle parking we could look at? Well, I think the, across the world, I mean, just uh, Cambridge North was mentioned at the earlier yeah. setting, which I think is a really good example. I mean, that's a new station, so the circumstances are quite different to, to the UK. Um, just, this doesn't answer your question, but cycling is the fastest growing mode of transport. Uh, I think we said uh, nearly 8%, 9% um, in 2016 increase. So we need to be ambitious. We need to plan for the future when we develop cycle parking, and that's what the Dutch do. Um, so, yeah, we you know, look to Holland, but look to big cities like New York too. I believe you have the potential for that Waterloo station, and that's proved nearly impossible. There's a huge unused space, so when you say they're obliged to make some money off any square footage, well... It's there and it's not being used now, but that's proved very, very difficult, which would seem to be that the, whatever agreement there is with the railways isn't correct if, you, if that can happen. Um, so that needs to be addressed at a political level, the highest level. I was just going to say, in, in outer London, where, and in fact, for that matter, in inner London and central London as well, but the boroughs that are installing bike hangers and, and multi-bike spaces on roads, things like that, we're seeing, you know, to, coming back to Matt's point about being ambitious and kind of planning for future demand, we're seeing demand dramatically outstrip supply. You know, the waiting list in most of the boroughs that, that have cycle hanger kind of arrangements is thousands of households, you know. So so we need to think about funding for those and how, what, how the funding streams work. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to see cycle parking funding cannibalising cycle infrastructure funding, you know, on road funding. But we should be identifying the boroughs that are really seeing growth in cycling people who can't store their bikes, people are struggling to store their bikes in flats, people are doing it, they need solutions and they need funding for that. Just a final point note from me, but I, might, there's, I think we should also be a bit careful in not throwing baby out with bathwater in that the, the, the fly parking, to give it that rather derogatory term, where it's done, as Simon said, where it's not causing any destruction, it's not causing problems for other people, yeah. I, I don't see a huge problem with that. And, the, you know, that is part of what London's existing cyclists rely on. So there's a bit of wriggle room I think that's wise to have. The question here is about should boroughs be more open? I don't know about more open, but they should be open to this happening in the, you know, in the right circumstances while definitely taking Simon's you know, distress signal point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. So we do come to the final item now, which is Mayor's targets and uh, Tom. Very much, Chair. Um, so my question is on mayoral targets. Um, what are the strengths of the mayor's draft transport strategy in terms of improving cycling infrastructure, and what's missing? I'm looking at Simon to start us off. I, mean, I think this, this, this much of the ambition is very, very, you know, exciting, and uh, we, you know, support. So we support the 80% target. We support the target uh, for 70% um, uh, of people, to, of residents, to live within 400 metres of, of a safe, high-quality route. Um, what's kind of missing is, is the detail. Um, so, firstly, interim targets, mode share targets for cycling. Um, we want to see those coming forward, um, but we also want to see some tighter to definition. Um, you know, if we are to achieve this this 80% mode share, and, and and that is a really it is quite an ambitious target. Um, if we want to achieve a, a zero vision for, for fatalities and, and uh, serious injuries in, in London, if we want to achieve many of these targets, we really have to start to to kind of demonstrate what they really mean in five years, in 10 years, um, in 15 years. Um, for instance, the 70% target, we're already seeing, you know, a lot of kind of uh, a lot of uh, politicking over what a safe and high quality route might be. Um, you know, we, we think that the bar really needs to be set high. I would suggest that Chris's earlier point about uh, would a 12 year old, uh, competent 12 year old ride on it um, is a really good one. Um, but for instance, Kensington and Chelsea uh, as a borough are already saying that they've basically hit that bar. Um, now I would argue, and I think the whole of London Cycling Campaign would argue, they're nowhere near that bar. Um, so, so you think there needs to be a tighter definition of there, what there constitutes to, so high quality, be, safe route. Absolutely, and there has to be a, a, a road map 
So, so the roadmap of how we get to the 80 percent, but also, yeah, much tighter definitions. And, and I think, again... As it, so are some interim targets along the way. Yeah, and I think we have to tie all of this to funding. So I think for the first time, we really have to be willing to say to boroughs, you know, Gilligan, Andrew Gilligan talks about the, the willing, the able, the willing and able, and, and those boroughs that are neither. Um, and I think we have to be willing to say, uh, as a city, you know what, if, if as a borough you are unwilling to deliver the quality needed, you should not get money because that money is badly spent. Um, if you are a borough that's willing to, to go through the political pain um, of, of delivering high quality cycling infrastructure um, and, and face the bike lash down and, and get through it, you should be funded as a priority. Um, so I think we have to, to tie funding to quality schemes. Um, that's absolutely vital if we're to achieve those targets. Do you think we need a specific cycling mode chair target within that 80%? Because I, I think it's, it, I find that a little bit nebulous, this sort of 80% mm. you know, public transport, walking, cycling. Do you mm. think we need to? Um, and if, and you, you say yes. What, what, what is a realistic <laughs> figure? So I, I, I don't really want to put a, a mode target out there, frankly, because uh, I think that's for the mayor and Will Norman to, to set and then for us to look at. Um, I, you know, and I think... More importantly than that, perhaps, actually, uh, you know, and, and interim targets are vital. We understand there is a cycling plan coming from Will Norman, um, so we're, we're going to look at those targets. But in a way, more important than targets is, is rate and pace of change um, and pace of delivery, which is that, that we know from, and, and this may be the one point I haven't covered here, is we know from other cities in Europe that actually one of the most explosive ways of delivering increasing cycling mode share and increasing cycle journey rates is delivering a true network. So we have a very scattered and incomplete network of routes at the moment that mostly don't link up, um, that have obvious gaps in. Um, so as we move towards a network, we would expect to see a lot more cycling rates uh, and the diversity of cycling increasing. Um, so in a way, delivering the network and, and it's going to be very, very hard to predict exactly what mode share will hit from that network. But delivering the network might get us way more mode share than we, we aim as a target. So I think delivering is, is more important than the actual target, but we also, we're also we going to wait and see what the mayor's going to come back with targets. And that, yeah, we think interim targets are important. Okay. I'll move along. Um, sorry, can oh, I... Sorry, Leanne, you want to so, chair. I mean, I, I, you know, I take your... Point about not necessarily willing to, willing to say, oh, 15% of the 80% should be cycling or something like that. But but just the overall point, do you think there should be some sort of mayoral target, which you're saying yes. you welcome coming from the mayor, but just to be very specific, you think there should be a target for cycling? Absolutely. We, we, we think there is. there should be broad targets for all broad. modes, yeah. uh, and, and those targets should yeah. be interim targets across... Yeah. You know, five-year periods and, and whatever. And with the parameters, then, is that where you're, you think there should be sort of, you know, at least 10% and aiming towards a maximum of 50%? Uh, oh, you know, uh, that would know. be ideal, as far as yeah, I'm concerned. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay. Just to to that, Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm yeah, just sure. wrestling with this one at the moment <laughs> about setting targets. Um, and it does seem quite an arbitrary thing to do. What I, I, I actually like accountability. I like measuring things, and I like accountability, but... Um, I mean, 2041, 23 years away, is, if, if you took this as a business going to the bank, the bank would say, that's great, tell me how you're going to achieve it. And they want to know what steps you're going to take, when you're going to yeah, take yeah. them before yes. they'll lend you the money, and that's yeah. perfectly reasonable. That's so when you say, well, actually, if I put in uh, a piece of segregated road between uh, this, this business or school and, and housing estate, all the evidence says I'm going to get a 200%, 300% increase. So, okay, I'll be measured on that. You know, if I'm allowed to put this in, then this is what it will deliver. So the targets, perhaps, that the mayor should focus on as delivering is, what is it, 36 kilometres of, or 36 miles um, of infrastructure that we know from evidence will deliver an increase in cycling. An overall one is politically very useful to actually, and it galvanises um, everybody behind that target and, and the same with the finances the money is actually not the hardest thing it's but it actually says to people that we've committed this and it's serious um, but it's all about how you actually get there and a target 23 years away is really hard for anybody to get excited about but tell me what you're going to do in five years and i know this takes time and then 10 years are probably the absolute maximum and that's the bit that the bank would be interested in i think this is why you know ha having some interim targets along the way would be helpful, I think, in yeah. terms of, in terms of yeah. judging yeah. that. 
Um, I think that for my, they'd, they'd be helpful, but they're only as good as what lies behind them. Yeah. So that they have, they are a bit gimmicky, but they do focus attention. Mm -hmm. But only if you've got the, the roadmap or whatever you want to describe it that is that is the program as to how you're going to get there. Um, that's the you know that's where it really happens. Um, I was going to go back to Matt on on, on the strategy and, and and all of these questions. Yeah, so the 80% target for um, trips by sustainable modes by 2041 is exciting. It's the first time that we'll respond to a consultation and not ask for a higher target at that level. We think that's uh, sufficiently ambitious. Um, but I think you're going to get consensus across this group around need for interim targets. Um, we, we like those long-term targets. We like that direction of travel, but there needs to be something the mayor's accountable for in his term. Um, and there is a, a shorter, near-term target for Vision Zero within the, the strategy. So I think you know there's opportunity um, to do that. Uh, the linking public health to the streets is a really important point, um, and the traffic reduction strategies for boroughs again is a, a really important piece. But the more you read the MTS, the more you you see what's missing, which is the stick, which you're going to come on to later. Um, but yeah, and the, the pressure on outer London to deliver these numbers, that's where these numbers are going to come from, and that's why the streets in outer London, responding to Caroline's report, need to change hugely. So Rachel, you're... <coughs> yeah, just, um, just coming in on that, um, I, the, the target, um, in principle, yes, um, for people living within 400 metres of a safe, high-quality cycle route, in principle, yes, great, but the definitions and the data needs to be in line with the definitions. We need data on where the safe, high-quality cycle routes are. And to give two examples, um, just coming in today, westbound along Cycle Superhighway 2, mostly not that bad. Suddenly, you're chucked onto a bus lane for 50 metres. Now, I'm what TfL used to call a hardened commuter, so I just jump onto it, look behind me, and pedal fast. But I wouldn't want a 12-year-old cycling on that so that whole route is problematic from that point of view or part of my commute to work which is a quiet way there's a bit of it that takes 5,000 6,000 motor vehicles a day again no one is going to let a child cycle on that so we need the data about where the problems are and where the high quality is second point on that um, destinations are important too, not just getting access to the network, but serving destinations by the network. So uh, an int I'm, I'm loath to multiply targets, but you know, looking at, for instance, schools, what proportion of schools can be reached by a safe, um, high-quality cycle route and indeed walking route. Um, just a point on mode share targets. Um, we, I, th I would like to see them actually at a borough level, and we can do that in an evidence-based way because TfL has done work on cycling potential, so we can see what's realistic by each borough. And from my own work, which is on cycle commuting potential, you know, a short-term target of 20% for Hackney might be achievable in the short term. For outer London boroughs, you know, 4% might be equally challenging. So you could have different targets for different boroughs. And, but what we might need to do is get more data to measure that because the London Travel Demand Survey is currently not um, powered to look at borough um, cycling levels beyond a three-year rolling average. So we might want to collect more data on that. But I think it might be worth it because ultimately the boroughs are going to be delivering a lot of this increase and we need to be able to track what they've achieved against what's realistic for them to achieve. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Justin? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of to, to add to that in some sense and, and to bring in uh, the example of Copenhagen and some of the myopia of the target. So it, it has only set a target for increasing its journeys in central Copenhagen. Um, it doesn't shout about it, but over the last 10 years it's seen uh, its bicycle journeys between inner and outer Copenhagen go down. It's seen car use increase over that, and that's partly because of its focus and the target on central Copenhagen. So much like Rachel, I'd like to see a target for cycling in outer London and at the borough level, I think could be really useful mm. um, as well. Um, and then just to come back to that first question, um, yes, I'd like to see some, um, same as everyone else, some kind of disaggregation of that, um, that target of 70%, um, because the danger is that we get towards the end of a term and the cycling target hasn't been reached, so we just focus everything on walking and public transport in order to, in order to try and get there, and we leave cycling behind. So mm, I'd like some disaggregation there as well. Um, Chris, have you got any more thoughts on what might be missing from the mayor's, the mayor's strategy? Um, safe space to ride on. I mean, with the, uh, safe space, sorry, safe space for... Well, we're, we're perhaps going back a little bit, but we, you know, there were... Well, and you've heard, again, you heard this... Um, few weeks ago from Andrew Gilligan, you had nine schemes, three are now in progress, I think, um, that P3 
people will do it when there is safe space and, and that's that's one of the things that would be tangible measurable and we know that would make a difference so measure me on how many kilometers I put in each year uh, and I think that's the way I'd like to be measured um, in my role is, is how much I put in and then I'll tell you how much that has increased the leveling of cycling and walking because that's within my control so the safe, how much safe space can you put in to do these things but more or less I I echo what's already been said. Do you have anything else to add, Richard? So what about this question then of stick rather than carrot, just finally? And obviously, as for, for politicians, this is always the, the, more, the more difficult of the two. Um, I mean, I'll start on that because it's another one I'm looking at, and it's a very hot topic. And we've had uh, congestion charging floated some time ago uh, in Manchester, and it was a disaster. And it was stopped. Um, and. Uh, and D. Burnham has said that we're not we're not going there again. I think it's really important that if you're going to have a stick, then you have to make sure there's a good carrot first. I mm -hmm. think in, in your, although it's a capacity, you're blessed with public transport is is excellent here. You know, I'm, the train this morning was full. There was another one one minute later. You know, which is which is phenomenal. And that tool is essential if I want somebody to get out of a private vehicle. I have to give them a viable alternative. Um, and I think that's important. But once you have that, then you make this less convenient rather than stick, if you like. Um, another benefit if you're 20 mile an hour zones is it actually evens up the modes of transport. This isn't a lot quicker, therefore, although I'm sitting in a traffic dam, it's still better than this. You're actually bringing this down. You're making traffic flow better by bringing the speed down. And you're actually making this option more viable. Uh, and I think that's really important to recognize that you're making this look more attractive. So it, it's more about I think convenience than, than stick. You make one more convenient than the other. It doesn't necessarily just have to be about charging uh, and reallocation of road space. Yeah, following on from that, I was really keen to talk about the street closures vehicle free zones example because I think it's very important um, not just to see that as a stick, um, that there are benefits and it's not just comfort benefits either, it's also streets become much safer as well as much more attractive. So I've been doing some current research looking at cycling injury risks specifically in London and one of the findings um, from the paper is that, um, for instance, Reducing motor traffic volumes from 6,000 to 2,000 motor vehicles a day is associated with a reduction in cycling injury odds of around 70%. So reducing motor vehicle volumes makes people cycling safer. And potentially, if more people cycling um, are not now cycling on those routes, the safety numbers benefit kicks in and it gets safer again. So it can really help with our injury risk problem. It's also something that people see as very attractive, reducing motor vehicle volume. So I did an intercept survey of a street where that kind of a reduction took place and asked pedestrians and cyclists about their views of the closure. And most indicators, this was asking about air pollution, noise pollution, um, feelings of safe walking, you know, all crossing the road, all the healthy street stuff. And most indicators, around 60 to 70% of respondents said the street was much better. So really strong views that a street was much better once there was a lot less motor traffic on it. And we also did an estimate of health benefit from increased walking and cycling. And it's, it was in the hundreds of thousands of pounds from this one street closure. So really, really big benefits, I think. And just finally to say something, other research I've been doing suggests that the benefits in terms of reducing motor traffic volumes are particularly strong for disabled pedestrians, that they're at particularly high risk of being injured by motor vehicles. So benefits for cycling, benefits for walking, not just a stick. Thank you. Uh, Matt? It would be really good if there was um, a little bit more consistency and ease with which you can close a road. In, at Sustrans, we, we do a lot of this kind of thing where you, um, you close a road and you use it in a different way just to give the community an idea about how the street could behave differently. Um, the only time that's happened where I live was when the Olympics were on. I think, you know, we've got the Royal Wedding this year. I mean, I'm sure people are going to be closing streets to do that. <laughs> it's a really interesting opportunity to just think about that space and, and how it's used. So um, we, had a, we had a colleague who, before he worked for us, he bought a skip and put it on the road, and he lived in that skip briefly because he wanted to make a point about that space and how that space is, is free to everyone. Um, and there is, a, there is a value to that space. Uh, and we, you know, the, the extension of the, uh, the ULES is really interesting, so getting people to understand how their behaviour has an impact and that will have a cost. But the technology behind that, we can, we can begin to use that and think about how people can understand that the streets have a cost and you using them has a, has a cost and you will need to eventually to begin to, to pay for that. Without, without that, I, I think I want to see kind of some kind of urgent talk about this. I think everyone working in this, this area understands that in the London context, with our growth, 
with the increase in car use in inner and outer London last um, studies, that, that it's really important to get this on the table and think about it. And it's not, it's not like a, a congestion charge across London. It's an intelligent use of um, how people move and charging them at particular times of day, particular vehicles, and, and to do that. So to begin that debate would be really useful in this term. Very difficult, I know. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we view smart road user charging as absolutely vital for, for city cars in the second term. And we think, you know, it, it's not quite as simple as you put the infrastructure in first and then, you know, you make, you make, make the alternatives available and then you start kind of uh, using the stick, as it were. Um, because in London, we're not going to get the space for cycling that we need on main roads. We're not going to get a, a lot of the schemes in that we want to get in unless we can reduce motor vehicle, private motor vehicle volumes in some key areas. So I think we really have to start getting those volumes down to give us the space. Because one of the constant concerns we have TfL raises, and, and probably quite rightly, is oh, if we put this scheme in here, we'll see traffic back up to the South Circular. Well, if that's, you know, if that's true and their modelling is right, then yeah, that's a real issue and we need to address that issue. And one of the ways is by reducing those volumes so that we can then put the scheme in. Um, so I think, I think road user charging is really vital. And I, I, I was just going to add to Rachel's point about the fact that I, I don't believe things like street closures and, and vehicle-free zones are stick. You know, I think we're, we've got, we're just finishing up a, a massive public consultation about Oxford Street. Prior to that, we had the bank junction closure. These are major, major schemes that remove motor, private motor vehicle traffic from our, our city. Um, do we view them, them as negatively uh, and as stick to the motorist? I, I hope not. I think what we should view them as is amazing opportunities to reclaim public space for our communities and our residents and our shoppers and our businesses and, and, and everyone. Um, so, you know, Walter Forest, you know, again, we've had the villages schemes, the low traffic neighbourhoods there. Um, and, and, you know, that means that some drivers are having to face a minute or two extra on their journeys. But, but is that a stick? Is that terrible? Or is that the fact that those in those areas, kids are playing out in the streets just for no reason? It doesn't require a play street. They just go out and they play. You know, I would view that as a carrot, personally. I, th I think those type of schemes are carrot, not stick. Um, so, yeah. The carrot stick distinction is, um, is only helpful up to a point. I think that's true. Because you know, one person's carrot is another person's stick. Mm -hmm. Stop <laughs> rat running, stopping <laughs> rat running <laughs> away. in those back streets is, is great if you live there or great if you're cycling and walking through there is possibly less great if you're driving through, although how great a driving experience it ever was is a question. Um, for us, there is a role also for um, road user, driver user, therefore really charging here. Um, as part of a package, it's not a magic solution. But I think ultimately London will have to come to that on a, on a broader geographic basis. Quite how that's done is then a really complicated set of questions that need proper investigation. But it is part of the, of the toolkit ultimately, I think. And for the reasons we've heard here, but also I think worth making the point that it is to make road journeys better for those drivers who need to make them. That is also part of the point there. So, you know, there is a real economic benefit to that. As against the economic disbenefit we have at the moment of lengthened journey times and predict, predict, in particular, sorry, unpredictable journey times, which is probably the single biggest issue for users of London's road network. So it's, it, it's, it's, um, it carries stick carries you so far as a, as, a, as a mechanism, but only so far. I think the other point is positive incentives. So we don't really have these in the system at the moment, but there are some parts of the world where drivers have been paid not to drive, yeah. for example. So ultimately, as you bring more charging systems in, which to a degree is happening anyways, we're having new layers, we'll have more road tolling, etc., with the new river crossings, you, you get nearer to that, perhaps, that world where you don't just have to do it negatively. Where does that take place? Uh, the Netherlands have gone for that on some major roads, I believe. Uh, Interesting. And, and it's where you, you get paid a, a small amount, but it, it's a signal, if nothing yeah. else. Um, and then you can, of course, play tunes with reducing the price of public transport as well as putting the price up of car transport. You know, there's a big variety of things you can do with that. Um, Justin, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, I've not got an awful lot to add, to be honest, except to, you know, that we should try and avoid the object lesson of Milton Keynes, where we had some pretty good cycle-specific in infrastructure built with no incentives to get people out of the car. And the choice that was made at the time by most people was just to stay in their cars. So it is the idea that we do need something, but I'm in agreement with everyone else. I think that we kind of need to brand that, um, you know, in a different way. Yes. Simon? I mean, I was just going to say, you know, I mean, 
I, th I think we've outlined our support for, for road use, smart use, road use charging. But, but also, I'd, I'd just point out the experience of driving in London is already a very powerful disincentive to drive in London. You know, we, yeah. we, we see the headlines uh, at the average bus speed in central London. We see the headlines for, you know, and, and, and unsurprisingly, then most people choose not to drive in, particularly yeah. in central London. We see that, you know, very strongly. Um, so I think, you know, we are already at a point where we don't need to, to we don't need to punish the motorist with a massive heavy stick. What we do need to do is, is drive down the motor vehicle volumes as we enable all the alternatives to come on, you know, straight. Point. Thank you. Okay, I think that's, I think we're done. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions? No? no? Lovely. Well, that's been very, very interesting and enlightening, actually. Um, I did like one of the opening comments and what's been coming through about you have to be bold and you have to be brave. And it's true, uh, just to bore you for a second. Uh, I had a situation where I wanted to introduce a sky ride. It's something Sky used to sponsor. It used to close all the street or a number of streets in your borough and um, make it open for cycling for one day. And the amount of criticism I got, the majority of people didn't want me to do the sky ride. I said, no, we're going to do it. We did it. And people who were the most critical were coming up to me and saying, that's the best thing we've ever done. So it's true, you do have to be bold and you have to be brave. And another clear message here, there has to be the political will and ambition. So thank you guys very much indeed. It's been a very interesting session. Thank you. Can, uh, can I ask the committee to uh, note the discussion? Thank you. Whilst our guests are going, can we... Um, Confirm the minutes of the meet last meeting. Indeed. Thank you very much. Can we uh, agree the list of summary actions? Three. Uh, and then we have some delegated authority um, action taken by the chair. So it's agreed a letter to the Mayor of London in response to transfer of London's consultation on Oxford Street. Agreed. 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 Agree a further response to transport for London on the committee's recent bus report. Thank you. Thank you. And note the responses from the Mayor of London in response to the committee's submission to the transformation of Oxford Street. Thank you. Ah, right. Um, just while people are moving, should we just quickly jump to item eight? Transport Committee's work program. We agree that. Yes. And the date of the next meeting, which will be Thursday, the first of February. Agreed. Agreed. Good. Agreed. Right. And then, if I can just jump back to, I think that. Oh, yeah. We'll jump back to item number six, which is the walking and cycling outer London junction report. Um, I'm here to invite. Caroline, to, introdu to uh, introduce the report. Do you want to say anything about the report, Caroline? I hadn't expected to, but um, oh, I'm, I'm happy to um, say that, yes, we re launched the report um, yeah. and um, we had a, a lot of constructive response to it. Brilliant. Okay. I'm sorry, Caroline. Uh, you, you should have been told about that. Um, okay. We have to... Uh, Agree the report. The report hasn't been agreed under delegated uh, chairman's uh, delegated authority. Uh, the reason for that is that I personally didn't uh, agree with a lot of the well, some of the content of the report, and I think that's very re re regrettable actually, because invariably rapporteurships go through; they're usually quite uncontroversial and get the support of the committee members. In this particular instance. I do feel that the report went outside of its remit and for those reasons I personally uh, regrettably feel unable to support the uh, report. Um, I think really the areas where it went mostly astray was firstly the recommendation that all roads should be 20 miles per hour. Uh, sorry, just as a point of order, there is no recommendation that all roads should be 20 miles an hour. That's, chair. That's, that's not the recommendation. That's not the recommendation, right, Chair. Exactly. We'll Please, um, can we look at the exact recommendations of yes. the report? Okay, that's, fair no, that's fair enough. Otherwise, we would not have signed up exactly. for that if you recall yeah. the debate right. in so, the yeah. Chamber so, of be, right, I was trying to, to summarise, but I'll, I'll read it out in full. So, uh, the recommendation is that the, the, the Transport for London road network 
or red routes, um, and that they should um, they should be made 20 miles per hour. I believe that is the no, no, that's, that's not the recommendation. Right. Chair, I'm, I'm slightly concerned. Any Perhaps the yeah, should we? Can I just, just check, maybe we could have some advice on the clock. The majority of members of the committee signed up to this report, therefore it has been agreed and we're just kind of effectively noting it today, isn't that correct? So we uh, agreed delegated authority to the chairman in consultation with party group leads to agree the report. Uh, the chairman chose not to use that delegated authority. So we've agreed it in draft at this stage and it's now coming to the committee for formal Right, to finally agree. Okay. Okay, well, then, then, sorry. Should, should we move to the vote on it, or are you well, that, the, yeah, the other sorry, there is there is recommendations that some of the roads should be 20 miles an hour. I believe that is true. Is that but, but chair, the it's dissenting um, recommendations, where groups dissent to them, are recorded in the report, yes, are they right. not? Okay. Right. Well, I think. Uh, I think probably the best thing to do, I just wanted to make the point around turning the corner and in relation to that I just feel that I would have been able to support turning the corner as a recommendation um, but again there is the recommendation that the, the Mayor should spend time and money on looking into that recommendation into the, the there, there is a recommendation that the mayor should. I mean, should, would you like to see the exact um, uh, recommendation on that? Um, uh, that I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. I don't like to interrupt um, Assembly Member Russell, and obviously I'm not normally a member of this committee. But my understanding was the, that we were going to vote on the report, and yes. um, Assembly Member Pigeon, who's the deputy chair, did suggest that we move to the vote, um, and I'd like to suggest that we move to the vote. As a procedural can I, can I just ask for you, Chair, uh, one point of clarification. It has been raised about this 20 mile hour issue, and there seems to be a divergence of opinion. And I haven't got the report in front of me. Can it's I ask for clarity of an office of what the report specifically says about 20 mile an hour, please? Um, I, I happen to have opened it because, obviously, as I was coming today, I took the trouble to read all of the paperwork, including the, the, the re yes, report on yes, pedicabs. Yes. Well, obviously, otherwise, I wouldn't really have been able to contribute anything. What it actually says in recommendation one, as I happen to have it to hand on page 217, is TfL should review the speed limits on all its roads in line with the healthy streets check. We ask for TfL to report back to us on its review by May 2018. On 20 mile an hour limits, TfL should look to international best practice and carry out some on-street trials in outer London in order to find, find ways that 20 miles an hour can be self-enforcing on main roads and at busy junctions. It doesn't say anything about enforcing a 20 mile an hour limit. TfL should write to us with a list of places in outer London for on-street trials by May 2018. The Mayor should also carry out a public information campaign to promote the work that the Metropolitan Police Service is doing to enforce 20 mile an hour, where it's already been um, obviously agreed. It must be clear to people that they can be caught and pr prosecuted for breaking 20 mile an hour limits, but that's only where they already exist. I think it's pretty clearly not saying we want 20 mile an hour limits um, introduced everywhere. Yes. Sympathetic to 20 mile an hour limits. It's a direction of travel. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but to, 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 say, to say that it, it, is, it is calling for 20 mile an hour limits. It's all for you, Chair. Sorry, it's all for you. Move to the vote. Move to the vote. Yeah, move to the vote. Okay, so those in favour of the report, please show. I'll follow the Chair. And those against. Six, six, four. Right, thank you very much. Uh, finally, uh, any other business? I haven't got any other business. No? Thank you very much. Thank you. GLA Chamber Sound GLA Chamber Sound